In March 2013, a man walking his dog on the outskirts of Peterborough in Cambridgeshire made a shocking and grisly discovery. Dumped in a rural ditch was the body of a man who'd been violently stabbed to death. The police didn't know it yet, but there was a serial killer on the loose. When is the next body going to turn up? We've got to find out who did this, and we've got to find it quickly. The investigation would lead detectives to a woman, a violent individual who'd killed without hesitation or remorse, and for no other reason than the pleasure and gratification it offered her. She is heartless, ruthless, and sadistic. During a 12-day killing spree, Joanne Dennehy butchered three men and left a trail of destruction that stretched from east to west across the UK. She's not somebody who feels bad, who feels remorseful, who regrets things. She does what she wants to do, and she doesn't care about the consequences. Joanne Dennehy had ruthlessly become one of the world's most evil killers. In April 2013, police in Hereford arrested a runaway fugitive and her besotted accomplice. In a killing spree that lasted almost two weeks, 31-year-old Joanne Dennehy had murdered three men and stabbed two others in broad daylight, leaving them for dead. One of the most dangerous women in criminal history, she's now locked away in prison and will remain there for the rest of her life. The fact that she'll never see daylight again in the outside world is of huge comfort for the family. For Joanne Dennehy, it's absolutely the right thing that she won't come out of prison. Joanne Dennehy's crimes were incomprehensible to the British public. At the time of her imprisonment, author and journalist Christopher Berry D took a special interest in the case. I wanted to really try to get inside how the police were working and how rapidly they caught this very dangerous woman. The strong curiosity he had for Dennehy's crimes caught the attention of the murderer herself, and very soon Christopher was in written correspondence with the killer behind bars. Her letters beautifully written, um, very eloquent, very good grammar, um, certainly on a par with you know, somebody of a good education behind them. Um, and we developed this relationship where I was trying to get inside her head but at the same time, she, being the arch manipulator, was trying to get inside my head. His attention peaked, and Christopher eventually went to visit Dennehy at Bronzefield Prison in 2015. She looked into my eyes and she said to me, Christopher, killing you would be good for me. And it was an ice-cold stare, I can tell you. So, yes, she would have killed me in a heartbeat if she'd had a chance. The story of this cold-blooded killer begins over 35 years ago in the picturesque city of St Albans in Hertfordshire. Joanne Dennehy was born in 1982 and began life in a loving and secure family home. Very few could have predicted this bright and intelligent young girl would turn into a sadistic monster with a taste for violence. By all accounts, she was starting off in life with a what we might say is a perfect foundational upbringing. Joanne Dennehy appears to come from quite a normal family. She had a relatively uneventful childhood. She's one of, of two siblings. Um, her, her mother worked in a supermarket. Her father worked as a security guard and for a, a telecommunications company. And from the outside, they appear to be a, a normal family. She had a sister to which she was very close. Uh, they had even developed a secret language. Uh, she, was, uh, she played netball for the school. Um, she was a very <laughs> normal, quite bright schoolgirl. But Dennehy's idyllic childhood was curtailed as she entered her teens. She started to experiment with drugs, she started not going to school, and she linked up with a man called John Trina. Her parents, they were at their wits' end. They didn't know what to do. Uh, they tried to keep her locked up or bring her home from school. The teachers tried to reprimand her. And the more they tried to control Joe, it was Joe saying, stuff you. And it, it was li literally like throwing petrol on a fire. Dennehy and Trina ran away together, embarking on a turbulent relationship. 
Despite Dennehy's violent outbursts, the couple had two children together and eventually settled in Cambridgeshire. I think quite a lot is made of the fact that Joanne Dennehy misused alcohol and, and drugs, but, but I think she's well aware of the fact that this is going to be discussed, and she knows that these offer quite a convenient excuse for her behaviour. And alcohol and drugs and other substances can disinhibit, but that's assuming that people have got those moral standards to begin with, and Joanne Dennehy didn't have them in the first place. A very disturbed woman, she had done a lot of self-harm, of cutting herself and so on. So there were a number of danger signs that this was somebody who was not attuned to society. As time went on, Dennehy's erratic behaviour intensified. She'd cheat on Trina and leave him and their two children for sporadic periods of time. Her drinking worsened and she reportedly began to carry a knife hidden in her boot. I think she's, she's somebody who perhaps has always enjoyed hurting other people. It's almost like she's this crazy scientist and the world is her experiment. Finally, in 2009, Trinor took the children and fled from Dennehy, afraid of what she might do next. The company that she was keeping as well, she was surrounded by people who were similarly disconnected. So, so I think when there was no check or filter or break on her behaviour, she was only going to get worse. Dennehy had become no stranger to the local police. She'd been in and out of prison for drug offences and was also given a 12-month community order for being in control of a dangerous dog. In February 2012, Dennehy spent three days on the psychiatric unit at Peterborough City Hospital, where she was diagnosed with a series of disorders. She has had various diagnoses attached to her, antisocial personality disorder, psychopathic personality disorder. And these are our conditions, they're not mental illnesses. And there's a real important difference between the two because people with personality disorders know the difference between right and wrong. They're, they're fully rational, they're in control of what they're doing, but they choose to do it anyway. So she's not somebody who feels bad, who feels remorseful, who regrets things. She does what she wants to do, and she doesn't care about the consequences. By 2013, 31-year-old Dennehy had settled in a small bedsit in Byfield, a housing estate in Peterborough. But the local residents were unaware of her troubled past or her violent nature. One of Dennehy's new neighbours was Michelle Bowles. She was polite to me. Like, but I wouldn't melt, melt on her mouth, basically. She was well-spoken to me and never swore. She was actually quite pleasant, do you know what I mean? I showed her respect. She loved babies. She was excellent with children. Um, I didn't have a problem with her. When I saw her or spoke to her, I said hello. She said hello back. But other residents were not so sure. Michelle's friend, John Chapman, lived in the same building as Dennehy. He was a Falklands War veteran who'd fallen on hard times. I don't know what regiment he used to be in. I should know, because the man of stories used to say. It's just John being smiley all the time and happy and like, nice to know. But John Chapman didn't smile when Joanne Dennehy was around. John was petrified. John came in mind and he said, on several occasions, there's this mad woman moved in. She says she's going to get rid of me whatever way she can. And he was right to be afraid. In just a few months, Joanne Dennehy's threats would turn to violence and John Chapman would be dead. In early 2013, Joanne Dennehy was living in sheltered housing in Peterborough following the breakup of her relationship. Her ex-partner had left her after becoming increasingly concerned about her erratic and sadistic behaviour. The bedsit that Dennehy now called home was managed by Kevin Lee, a father of two who lived in Peterborough with his wife, Christina. She remembers hearing about this strange new tenant. Christina has asked for her identity to be concealed. He was stressed with work, the money element of it, it was turning into kind of a nightmare, really. It was getting a little bit unmanageable. Kevin used to house disadvantaged people. So he'd done it for years, and obviously he was used to giving people chances. Um, and so he did with, with 
her. But Kevin Lee and Dennehy's relationship quickly grew into more than just a business one. Lee began to employ Dennehy as a rent collector. Obviously, I wasn't aware at the time. To me, it would have been just another tenant. And he just said about this woman and that she's really tough, really hard. He needed to evict some people. And whether she was threatening and it suited him, because he wasn't getting any joy from the council. So I think she had a bit of wellies and, you know, a really big mouth and threatening. And I don't know whether that, at the time, he thought that was his only way out and to deal with these people. 48-year-old Kevin Lee became infatuated with the younger Dennehy, and they soon became lovers. In exchange, Dennehy was living rent-free in at least two of Lee's properties across Peterborough. In a household, that becomes quite apparent if someone's behaviour's sort of changed and didn't seem quite himself. Dennehy would make up unnerving stories to impress her new landlord and lover. At one point, she told Kevin Lee her father had abused her and that she'd killed him. Absolute nonsense, of course, never did anything of the kind. She was neither abused nor did he, was he dead. But she was also a pathological liar. Kevin just said about her that um, she spent eight years in prison because he raped her as a child, abused her as a child. Um, it's not unbelievable story, but then when Kevin said that she'd also killed other people and that she hadn't got caught for those, it sounded a bit far-fetched. I just I didn't know what to think. I didn't know whether it was a truth or whether it was just a load of old rubbish. But it wasn't long before Joanne Dennehy turned her murderous fantasies into reality. 31-year-old Lukas Slabozewski had moved to the UK from Poland in 2005. After meeting Dennehy a few days previously, he began exchanging text messages with her. On the 19th of March 2013, Slabozewski went to visit Dennehy at one of the houses she was staying in on Rolleston Garth and was never seen alive again. She almost certainly lured this man with the promise of some kind of sexual favour. But without a moment's hesitation, she stabbed him through the chest once, very, very hard, killing him almost instantly. Slabozewski had been coaxed into Dennehy's deadly embrace. She led him to believe the pair were in a relationship. He willingly and naively entered the trap she'd laid for him. Everybody that comes into contact with Joanne Dennehy, it's like falling into a spider's web, and you can't get out. Men can't get out. They become entranced by her for all sorts of reasons. Dennehy had complete disregard for the life she'd just taken. Dennehy puts this poor Polish man's body in a wheelie bin and then shows it to a 14-year-old. And so, look how, how clever I am. I've killed this man in the wheelie bin. But it was only a temporary solution. Dennehy knew she couldn't keep Slabozewski's body in a bin. She had to dispose of it quickly, but she needed help. She called upon one of her friends, 47-year-old Gary Stretch, who was more than willing to assist. Joanne Dennehy is quite bright. She's quite clever. So she's able to exert quite a lot of control in her interactions with, with other people. And that's what makes her exceptionally dangerous. Now, looking at the relationship that Joanne Dennehy had with her accomplices, I think she was able to, to charm these men. She was able to kind of lure them in, really, and they would have been flattered by her attentions. You know, here she is, this younger woman wanting to spend time with them. These were men who had quite dull, quite boring lives, and I think they were quite excited to, to get involved in, in what Joanne wanted to do. At seven foot two inches tall, Gary Stretch towered above Dennehy's slight frame. An unsuccessful burglar, Stretch was absolutely infatuated by her twisted and lethal charms. Gary Stretch and Joan Den, he met uh, when both of them were on parole from prison for various offences. She realised that she could use him to do whatever she wanted. Um, he was her bodyguard, her minder. Um, and that's how they formed this team, which became so overpowering for Stretch that he would do anything for her. I don't think Joanne Danny had any emotional feelings towards her accomplices whatsoever. They were useful to her at the time and, 
and she just cast them aside when she was finished with them. With the help of Stretch, Dennehy dumped Lukas Slabozewski's body in a ditch in rural Thorny Dyke, just 10 miles east of Peterborough city centre. Unable to control herself, her confidence rising and her desire for violence building, in just over a week, Dennehy would strike once more. She turned her attention towards her fellow Byfield resident, 56-year-old Falklands War veteran John Chapman, who reportedly had walked in on Dennehy while she was in the shared bathroom of their bedsit. Every time he spoke about her, he was sh with fear, like this, the, in his tone of voice. And we thought, it's just John, J John, just leave it. If she starts, here's our phone numbers, ring us, and we'd come around, just, you know, help you and get you in here with us. He went, thanks. And that was the last time we saw John. On March the 29th, 2013, Dennehy attacked the helpless John Chapman. John Chapman was an inoffensive, kindly man who may have been asleep or in an alcoholic stupor when Dennehy killed him. But she did so by stabbing him once in the neck, severing his carotid artery, and then five times in the chest with such force that one wound broke the breastbone. Um, it also punctured his heart. It's a frenzy that is quite difficult to comprehend, but evidence of what the behavioral scientists now call escalation. First victim, one stab wound. Second victim, six stab wounds. It's heartbreaking. To see a poor defenseless man killed. And to know what she'd done to him, how she killed him. It was just heartbreaking for us all. Dennehy was developing her confidence and her crimes were becoming more and more brutal with each move. Now, where Joanne Dennehy is so bad is that this woman actually used a knife to attack a grown, strong man is very up close and personal. It's not at the point of a gun, which is not quite a personal thing. It's not by bludgeoning. It's not by strangulation. By nature, a woman is not often strong enough to strangle a strong man. But this is a young woman using a knife to repeatedly stab somebody. And for that reason alone, makes her a hands-on, blood-lusting killer. I can't describe how evil this woman is. I really can't. She's the worst I've ever met. It's always been said the woman's method of killing is usually poisoning. It can sometimes be other things, but knives, no. It's a very male killing method. And it's led some people to speculate that Dennehy was to some extent trying to be more male, more masculine, than the men around her, because she felt they were rather f weak and feeble, and she had to be the boss, and being a boss meant you were male. But Dennehy was offsetting one role with another, that of a femme fatale, charming and enticing men into her life, before switching character in an instant with deadly results. We're quite quick to, to point to Joanne Dennehy's masculine traits, because they're the ones that, that are most visible to us her aggression and her violence and the very brutal way in which she perpetrated these murders. But I don't think she's somebody who would be like that all the time, because that wouldn't serve her needs all of the time. I think sometimes she was feminine and she was demure. In a way, she, she's somebody who will just adapt her, her behavior. Um, so it's, it's very difficult to know who the real Joanne Dennehy is. After killing John Chapman, Dennehy didn't hesitate in continuing her rampage. On the very same day, she'd strike again with fatal consequences. Later that day, she lures her boss and her lover and the bed-sitting house's owner, Kevin Lee, to the house. But this time, Dennehy wasn't in the mood for love. She was searching for another victim to try and quench her murderous desires. March the 29th would be the last time that Kevin Lee was seen alive. Joanne Dennehy was in the middle of a murderous rampage. Having taken the life of 31-year-old Polish man Lukas Slabozewski 10 days earlier, 
Dennehy had just killed 56-year-old John Chapman and had a third victim in her sights, her landlord, Kevin Lee. The pair had been having a secret affair. Kevin's wife, Christina, was the first to notice something was awry when he didn't arrive home on that March evening. He was very much like a come home from work, tea on the table, pyjamas on. He was quite sort of traditional and old-fashioned in that sense. I tried to ring him and his phone wasn't on, which was odd in itself. He'd never have his phone switched off because it's, that's, that was his livelihood, that was his business. And I knew it had charge. Kevin had felt threatened by Dennehy days before, but he'd wrongly assumed it was just bravado. Kevin did tell me that she told him that she wanted to kill again. And I think that was the crucial thing, because it wasn't just a case of bragging or mentioning that she'd committed murders in the past. It was the fact that she specifically told him she wanted to kill again. So that's going to unnerve anybody, false or not. It's just not a thing that normal people say. Hours passed. Growing desperately concerned, Christina, with the help of Kevin's business partner, Paul Creed, tried to trace Kevin. I asked Paul to look at Kevin's phone records, so he gave them to me, and there was a number that kept appearing on the telephone, and I said to Paul, I said, um, which houses are empty at the moment because they need work doing to them? And he gave me a list, and I subsequently just went round to each of those properties. I knew he was in trouble, put it that way, at that point. I knew there was something not right. I knew Kevin wasn't coming home. Christina began an urgent hunt, unaware her search was in vain. Dennehy had already struck. She'd stabbed Kevin Lee to death at the same house in Rolleston Garth where she'd murdered Lukas Slabozewski ten days earlier. Lee was Dennehy's third victim. I wouldn't describe Joanne Dennehy as a serial killer. I would describe her as a spree killer because there didn't seem to be any points during her, her killing spree in which she returned to any semblance of, of what was a normal life for her. It tended to be a, a continuous chain of events. What is not in doubt is that these first three victims were simply a prelude to what she hoped would be a further spree. Dennehy, again with the help of Gary Stretch, and this time another accomplice, Leslie Layton, deposited the bodies of John Chapman and Kevin Lee on the outskirts of town. Chapman was placed at Thorny Dyke, the same spot where they dumped Lukas Slabozewski's body 10 days previously. Kevin Lee was left 10 miles further north at nearby Newbra. Dennehy dressed Lee's body in women's clothing and left him positioned in a grotesque and crude manner with his buttocks exposed. I think Joanna Dennehy was unusual in that she liked humiliating her victims. There was clearly uh, a modus operandi there and there was a clearly a motive, the pleasure of, of killing somebody rather than doing it for some particular reason. Oblivious to the fate of her husband, Christina Lee was becoming increasingly concerned about Kevin's whereabouts. I rang the police, then I went back with Paul Creed to one specific house because I noticed that the light wasn't on and then it was on when we went back later. So I thought there's obviously somebody at the house and I just said to the police, you know, I'm really worried, expressed my concerns and gave them permission to break into the house which they did. Inside the house on Rolleston Garth, there were no obvious signs of trouble, but the police immediately sensed that something was wrong. They said that they could smell, there was a really strong smell of bleach, and they could see some blood on the floor, and, you know, I just knew. And Christina wouldn't have to wait long for news of her husband. The following day, March the 30th, 2013, police were called to an area of farmland in Newbra by a dog walker who'd made an horrific discovery. You know, you see it on TV all the time, the dreaded knock at the door, um, and then two detectives came, and obviously he had not been identified at that point, but they just said that they'd found a body, 
which, you know, I was expecting to hear that. So they just kind of told me what I was expecting to hear. You don't feel anything, because you... Because you know. And it's a feeling that you've never felt. So, you know, where some people might think you'll be doing this, you'll be doing that. I don't know, it's just kind of a blur, really. You're just alive, I think that's... But not alive, you're just existing. For police, a very serious picture was beginning to emerge of a killer on the run with an unstoppable determination for destruction. When is the next body going to turn up? We've got to find out who did this, and we've got to find them quickly. Detectives soon discovered Kevin Lee's burnt-out car. Christina had provided them with Dennehy's phone number, and by using it, they were able to form a crucial link. They must have been trying to call it to, and using their systems or whatever, must have tracked it down through GPS that the location of Kevin's burnt-out car was where this mobile had been. So it was quite obvious that she'd been there. They realised that he knows somebody called Joanne Dennehy, and there was an affair between them. And then they came across a man called Leslie Layton, who they interviewed. He tried to cover up. He didn't know anything about them, where they were, which, in fact, he did. He soon cracked because he was weak-willed, spineless. And he said, yes, Dennehy and Stretch are on the run. They've gone east and they'll probably come west. And with that, the police went wallop. They, they issued a national wanted alert for every agency in the country to find these, this couple as quickly as possible. Dennehy and Stretch were now wanted fugitives. She reveled in the idea, high on the thrill of being on the run. She loved the notoriety of it. Um, she relished the fact that the men around her were frightened of her. In an attempt to try and evade the authorities, Dennehy and Stretch first headed to Norfolk, where they burgled a house. They then made their way across country to Hereford with the intention of selling the stolen goods to help fund their escape. Dennehy and Stretch became a, a sort of a, I hate to say this, a Bonnie and Clyde type outfit. Their faces were in all the newspapers now. They were wanted, most wanted. After they burgled another property in Hertfordshire, the pair stopped 20 miles outside of Hereford to liaise with a man named Mark Lloyd, who joined Dennehy and Stretch on the journey. They get an accomplice or a friend of theirs to bring the stolen property into Hereford town to sell it, and it's at that point that Dennehy decides she wants to kill again. It had been four days since the murders of John Chapman and Kevin Lee. On April the 2nd, 2013, with Mark Lloyd in tow, Dennehy was caught on CCTV entering this small shop in Hereford at 3.30 p.m. She's seen pointing at the cashier in a threatening manner. Just 10 minutes after this footage was captured, Dennehy, in an unprovoked random attack, attempted to murder a fourth man. She had this terrific anger and bloodlust. She's had a quarter of a bottle of whiskey. She's been smoking roll-ups, and she suddenly sees a man walking his dog in broad daylight, and she says to Stretch, stop, we stop the car, I want to kill him. Brandishing a knife, Denny jumps out of the car and runs up behind him and stabs him in the back. Dennehy's unfortunate victim was Robin Baressa, a 63-year-old retired fireman. You knew exactly how she, what she intended to do. I'm going to kill you, she said to the fireman. I want to hurt you, I'm going to kill you. And she plunges this five-inch lock knife into his back time and time and time again. The man thought he'd been punched. He turned around and saw her covered in his blood. He collapsed. She calmly walked away and got in the car and said to Stretch, no, let's go and find somebody else. Back in the car, Dennehy took the time to pose for this selfie. It seemed unbelievable to imagine, but she wasn't finished. Having felt the thrill of attack once, she hunted out her second victim of the day. Ten minutes after the first attack, she spots another man walking his dog, and it was the same bloodthirsty scenario all over again. She got out and she told Stretch to stop the car. She got out with this very small knife, uh, walked up to him and plunged it into him time and time and time and time again. 
Can you imagine the shock? This man wouldn't have known what was happening. It's broad daylight. She's licking the blood off of the knife, his blood. He, he feels himself getting dizzy and sick, and then he collapses. And she takes this dog, walks casually back to the, the car. Another car passes, and she waves at the people in it. They get in the car, and off they go. This second helpless victim was John Rogers, a 56-year-old Hereford local. Dennehy stabbed him more than 30 times. It was an horrific and entirely spontaneous act, completely lacking in reason. It is a reflection of a brutality, a viciousness, a lack of any kind of control that makes Dennehy very unusual. She is a most frightening figure who uh, behaves in the most obscenely violent way imaginable, almost defying belief. When we look at the, the two attempted murders, you know, towards the end of her, her spree, this is something altogether different. These are strangers, these are men that, that she doesn't know. So I think what was happening here was that she was upping the ante, she was getting bored. You find that psychopaths tend to have a proneness to boredom and a need for stimulation, so, so she was even applying that to her murders. Remarkably, both men survived these attacks. Although their injuries were life-threatening, they were still able to give the police descriptions of Dennehy and the instantly recognisable star tattoo on her cheek. By now, the police sirens are going all round, and blue lights are going all round Hebridgeshire. They're panicking, it's like somebody's kicked over a wasp nest. The local police had been alerted to her spree and were about to put an end to her bloodshed. They cornered Dennehy and Stretch on Newton Close in Hereford. Two officers turn up and they spot this car with Dennehy in it, talking to the dog on the back seat, while Gary Stretch is trying to negotiate stolen property at the front door of one of his associates' house. They arrest Dennehy on the spot. Gary Stretch and one of his friends do what they call in police parlance a runner. They jump in another car and speed off. Something like a car chase goes on for about 20 miles. And then Stretch decides to get out and run for it. Now, Mr. Stretch is not built for speed. And of course, he's very unfit and he's stopped. And he turned around to the police officer and said, ah, you've arrested me. Joe and I would have been the next Bonnie and Clyde. Footage of Dennehy in custody at Hannyford Police Station just 40 minutes after stabbing two men and leaving them for dead showed her laughing and joking with the arresting officers. One mark for attempted murder. And murder. Attempted murder and murder, murder. 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 So I'm going down for Sunday roads. Uh, Excuse me. Joanne Dennehy is like a chameleon. Um, she's become a very accomplished actor, so she will play to whatever audience is in front of her. Um, she can be charming and, and sound very educated and, and literate. And at the same time, to another audience, she could sound quite rough and quite downbeat. So she's, she's really honed these, these skills of responding to, to the people that, that are around her. The following day, April the 3rd, 2013, the bodies of Dennehy's other two victims were discovered just outside of Peterborough. In a ditch on farmland at Thorny Dyke, investigators found 31-year-old Lukas Slabazewski and 56-year-old John Chapman, a close friend of Michelle Bowles. We wasn't concerned till we actually noticed he was missing. No one had seen him at all. The next thing we knew, the forensics were around the back of the house. We were praying outside, thinking, please don't let it be John, let him live. If we had known what he meant and what she was gonna do at the time, we would have got John out of that house and let him live with us. But how were we supposed to know she was a serial killer? To take John's life, Lucas's life and Kevin's life, why? Joanne Dennehy's pre-trial hearing was set for the 18th of November. It's very difficult to understand quite how far the road is from a nice suburban upbringing to a ditch in Peterborough where you're dumping the bodies of men you've stabbed to death. It's an extraordinarily long road.
a very dangerous one and a very destructive one, but she certainly travelled it and took some pleasure in the travelling. At the hearing at the Old Bailey, Dennehy was devoid of remorse. She laughed as proceedings took place and stunned her legal team when she chose to plead guilty. The fact that Joanna Dennehy decided to admit murdering these three men and denying them a lawful burial took the whole of court two by surprise, including her defence barrister, who said that proceedings weren't going as anticipated. So the judge asked Joanna Dennehy in the dock what she'd said. She told him, I have pleaded guilty, and that's that. Karim Khalil, defending Gary Stretch, remembers the shock that rippled through the courtroom when this unexpected plea was heard. It surprised all, I think, but the judge, who seemed entirely satisfied with that result. Um, her counsel asked for time to speak with her to see whether she really had meant what she just said and returned to tell the court that, yes, she entirely understood the charges against her. She meant to plead guilty, and that was the end of it. Many of the serial killers I've interviewed, obviously as guilty as sin, try to hide behind the criminal justice system and use it as uh, a defence uh, to retreat back into it, uh, to use mitigation. Uh, um, I didn't intend to kill somebody, but I had a drink disorder or a drug disorder. Or I'm not culpable of committing these crimes, basically, I'm innocent. Joanne Dennehy is not like that. She just loved it. Kevin Lee's widow, Christina, couldn't bring herself to face the woman who dragged her husband down into her own sordid world and destroyed her family. I went to court, but I stayed in the family room. I didn't want to be in there because I didn't want that thing to ever see my face. I thought, you haven't got the luxury to grace my face, so therefore you shall not see me. Just that cocky and pathetic and so predictable. And I just thought it's just so abhorrent that I thought, no, it's just best off in another room. During the hearing, Dennehy's partner in crime, Gary Stretch, argued he was manipulated by her throughout the killing spree. Gary Stretch's position was that he had not known that she was going to kill any of the people that she killed, um, whilst accepting that after the event, um, he was made aware that she had killed people. And the difficulty, of course, that he confronted um, was the assertion that he was a willing participant in covering up those killings once he became aware of them. There's no question in my mind um, that uh, Dennehy uh, did influence uh, Gary Stretch hugely. Joanne Dennehy is somebody who was very much in the driving seat all the way through the, the murders that, that she committed, and the men were just there in, in a supporting role. You know, she was, she was the, the centre stage actor here, and I think the fact that she was doing this on her own, she wasn't coerced or compelled by, by anybody else, does make her quite unique. In a final act of defiance, Dennehy refused to relinquish control of her fate over to the legal system. She stood up in court and told the judge exactly how she felt. I don't want to be controlled by anybody. I don't want to be in control by my lawyers, by the police, by anybody. And that's what she told the judge. Get stuffed, basically. Get stuffed, Your Honour. On February the 28th, 2014, Mr Justice Spencer sentenced Joanne Dennehy to a whole life term. She became the first woman in British history to directly receive this highest of custodial sentences in a courtroom. Dennehy was immediately sent to Bronzefield Prison. She will never be released. Dennehy's accomplices were also imprisoned for their part in her crimes. Leslie Layton, who helped dispose of two of the bodies, received 14 years. And Gary Stretch received two life sentences. It was a bittersweet relief for Michelle Bowles. It's a victim's family as well, they're carrying the life sentences, isn't they? Carefully, he's not going to see his kids like, have kids. Lucas is never ever going to have kids. John, you know, he's never going to be around again. None of them are. He wasn't a horrible person. He was one of the loveliest, generous people you could ever meet. He really was. He would have done anything for anybody. It'll take years for Christina Lee and her family to get back to normal after Dennehy callously ended the life of her husband. Personally, it makes you want to 
rethink the death penalty. To me, that'd be too easy for somebody like that. Let them rot wherever they are, really. So, yeah, I expected that. I think it was just so hideous how a female, you know, it's hard to even think that's a woman. Would I say she got what she deserved? Not at all. She didn't get what she deserved. She just is where she needs to be. It's just everything, everything has changed. You know, what was a family unit and people just going about their business, everything came crashing down. He was a laugh a second. He was the most, one of the most optimistic persons I've ever come across. Never moaned about anything, not negative about anything. Any problem would be overcome. We laughed a lot. So, yeah, we had a lot of fun. Joanne Dennehy has refused to disappear quietly. Even in prison, she's continued to wreak havoc. From the day Joanna Dennehy was sentenced to prison, she has exhibited more antisocial behavioural traits in as much as she's tried to escape twice. She wanted to chop the fingers off a, a prison officer and use that on the electronic keypads to get out. Dennehy's absolute lack of remorse and the savagery involved in her crimes are beyond the public's understanding of what a woman would usually be capable of. Joanne Dennehy was unusual in that the most notorious women murderers in this country have tended to be associated with a man, either Myra Hindley associated with Ian Brady or Rose West associated with her husband Fred. Dennehy was kind of acting alone, although she had people helping her a bit afterwards, covering things up, but she was a kind of self-motivated murderer. I think the, the reason that we're so fascinated and so shocked by female serial killers is because of our general expectations of the role of women in society. We expect them to be the carers and the nurturers and the givers rather than the takers of life. Dennehy touched the public imagination because she was a young woman and one who seemed to contradict everything that most of us expect of women and to do so in such a cavalier and violent way that she set herself apart from the female population. She's in prison now, and she's going to be in prison for the rest of her life, but Joanne Dennehy will not stop manipulating. She will manipulate the system, she'll work the system, and when the time's right, she'll definitely kill again. It's difficult to comprehend the insatiable killing spree of Joanne Dennehy. With a lust for blood and a twisted lack of morals, she manipulated others along her way as she murdered three men and brutally attempted to kill two strangers in broad daylight. The safest place for a dangerous individual like Joanne Dennehy is behind bars, which is where she will remain for the rest of her life. Lane County Courthouse, Eugene, Oregon. May 8th, 1984, a US mail carrier and a mother of three stood accused of the murder of her daughter, seven-year-old Cheryl, and the attempted murder of her two other children, eight-year-old Christy and three-year-old Danny. Her name, Diane Downs. Diane Downs was pure evil, wrapped up in someone who had a smile. Uh, to this day, she has never admitted that she did the deed. But when her daughter, Christy, testified, the terrible truth was all too clear. When the person asked her the question, who shot you and your siblings, she says, my mum did it. It was a court case that shook America, and all the while Downs insisted she'd never harmed her family. She violated that sacred duty and attempted in cold blood to kill all three of her children. The callous murder of her daughter and attempted murder of her two other children makes Diane Downs one of the world's most evil killers.
Springfield, Oregon, May 1983. The small industrial town that lies next door to the city of Eugene was home to one of America's most reviled murderers, Diane Downs. The 27-year-old mother had driven her three children to a remote location just outside of town. Diane Downs then pulled over to the side of the road and shot each of her three children. Seven-year-old Cheryl died. Her siblings, Christy and Danny, survived the ordeal but were left scarred. This seemingly senseless attack stunned the nation. What makes this case exceptional is that Diane Downs doesn't look like any other mother who kills their children. Most mothers who kill their children, their children are babies. They're under the age of 12 months. These mothers are from pretty desperate circumstances. But Diane Downs was something altogether different. And we're talking about what the president did in deciding not to go... Talk to show host Lars Larsen was a young investigative reporter assigned to the sensational story in 1983. This case involving Diane Downs really had everything. It had a mother, it had children, murder and sex and mystery. And you had an American murder suspect who had tried to murder her three children and succeeded with one of them and horribly wounded the other two. Downs was having a relationship with a married man a fellow colleague at the US post office where she worked. Diane Downs said she was in love with this man. This was the man she wanted to be with. She thought that by eliminating the children, that that would be the last hurdle she would have to jump over to be able to be with this man forever. Downs had decided that he was the most important person in her life, bar none. Here we've got a mother who relentlessly pursued her own wants and desires and really didn't care about her children. I suspect she's a classic example of a narcissistic killer. The only thing she thinks about is herself. Her children exist in the world for her. She doesn't exist in the world for her children. And her life history suggests that is true. This was a way to change her life. This was a way to get a new boyfriend, the boyfriend she wanted. And that meant so much to her that it was more important to her than the life of her children. This killer's story begins over 60 years ago. Diane Downs was born on August the 7th, 1955, in Phoenix, Arizona. You know, there's little to indicate that there was anything especially abnormal about her family life. Her father was a postal worker and her mum was a, a stay-at-home mother. Uh, her father was quite the disciplinarian. He had some quite strict rules. He would often give lectures to his children about how to behave. But it was very much a stereotypical American nuclear family. As a teenager, Diane met Stephen Downs while in high school and they became a couple. When she was 17, Diane enrolled in Bible College in Orange, California. But soon problems began to brew. Diane had gone to Bible College, but that hadn't lasted very long. She was only there for two semesters, and she was kicked out of college because of, quote, her promiscuous behavior. And, and that's a theme that we see throughout her life. After her expulsion, Diane returned to her parents' home in Arizona and married Stephen Downs. They got married when she was 18. Now, she was very quick to, to want to start a family, and they soon had their child. Their first daughter, Christy, was born in October 1974. Just over a year later, Diane had her second child, a girl she named Cheryl. Diane and her husband had two children together, and after this, her husband decides that's it, enough, our, our family's complete, and he goes and has a vasectomy. But Diane is absolutely adamant she wants another child, so she goes and has a, a short-term affair with uh, another man and becomes pregnant with her son, Danny.
I suspect that she engaged in what I call instrumental sex. And what I mean by this is for some women, sex is a tool, it's a weapon. Uh, they want to get pregnant because they believe that that will create a relationship. Diane seemed to really enjoy the pregnancy stage of motherhood, but when the baby actually arrived, she didn't quite like that so much. There are lots of reports that she left the children alone, she left them unattended. When they got home from school, they were waiting on the porch for, for hours at a time. In 1980, Diane and her husband Stephen divorced. Soon after, Downs was pregnant again. That's because she'd volunteered to be a surrogate mother. At the time in the United States, there were approximately 100 surrogate mothers in the entire country. That, those are the estimates at the time. So being a surrogate mom put you in a very rarefied piece of air. Y you were unique. And she was actually interviewed for a national newspaper in the early 1980s, and she very much seemed to enjoy that experience. So she's got a taste of, of that limelight, and, and she will use her, her role as a woman, her role as a mother, as a way to get people to look at her. In 1981, she was paid $10,000 by a couple desperate to have a child. Nine months later, Downs gave birth to a baby girl that she handed to the sponsoring couple. That same year, she got a job with the US Postal Service. There, she had an affair that would be the catalyst of catastrophe. He was a married man who she encountered. They, they were sexually involved. Surprise, surprise, this is what she does. And he was fine with just having an affair. But once Diane Downs wanted a real relationship with him, he, he was done. Now, she's had quite a lot of short-term relationships with people in this workplace, in, in the post office. And he believes that, actually, this is just going to be a bit of a fling, because he knows what her reputation is. But she becomes quite fixated on him. She wants them to have a, a longer-term relationship. But instead, he ended things. He made it very clear to her he didn't want to raise her children and he didn't want to have children by her. And I believe at the point at which he says that to her is when she decided that if he won't have me with my children, maybe he'll have me without them. The key thing is that he doesn't want to be the stepfather to her children. So her children at this point in time, they become a barrier to her getting what she wants. By the end of 1981, Diane Downs had moved over 1,200 miles north to Springfield, Oregon. Now, after she moves to, to Oregon, she expects that he's just going to follow her. And actually, that doesn't happen. He's not interested. Diane Downs pursued the man she loved for nearly two years, writing and even visiting him to plead for his affections, to no avail. The cold-hearted mother of three then came to an incredible conclusion. In order to be with the man she loved, she had to kill her children. Late in the afternoon of May the 19th, Diane Downs took her three children, eight-year-old Christy, seven-year-old Cheryl, and three-year-old Danny, on a fateful journey. They were headed to a farm in the small rural town of Marcola, just 12 miles away from their home in Springfield. She's going kind of out of the way from, from where she lived. She's on the opposite side of town. So she appears to be doing things that, that aren't particularly rational. The children had no idea that their mother had made a dreadful decision. In order to run away with a man she was obsessed with, Diane Downs had planned to kill her children that evening. When we see a killer who says, well, I was gonna kill my children and then I could be with this man forever, we say, well, that's irrational, that's crazy. But to her, I think it made perfect sense. She's completely smashed any of our expectations about mothers. They should put their children first, and that is something that she's never done. Diane Downs drove her three children to a co-worker's house in Marcola. 
and her children get to see the horses and pet the horses, and she talks to this co-worker, and they visit for a while. The problem was the woman she was visiting had no idea Downs was coming. This friend doesn't seem to be able to make sense of, of why Diane has suddenly turned up there. The unusual trip was part of Diane Downs's carefully designed murder plan. The visit to see the horses would serve as an alibi. She thought, if I could just get rid of these three children, then I could go with the love of my life. But she had to do it, so she conspired for a long time. She arranged this phony visit to a friend's house that she never visited before. She conspired to be driving home late on a lonely road a long way from any houses or any activity. I believe that she was planning this for at least days, could have been even weeks. One thing that we need to understand about these crimes is that because she's driving down the street with a, a loaded gun, which means before she stepped into that car, she knew she was going to kill her children. In keeping with her pernicious plan, after leaving the farm, Diane Downs packed the children in the car and drove to a carefully chosen site on Old Mohawk Road. She pulled over and got out of the car. We are talking about a premeditated homicide. This is something that the average person thinks of as inconceivable and impossible. With the children not suspecting a thing, she went to the trunk of the car. She pulled out a Ruger 22 caliber semi-automatic pistol, walked back to the driver's side with the gun in hand. When the children first see the gun, the, they have to be in total disbelief. It, it has to be inconsistent with all of their experiences. Then she knelt on the seat, leaned forward towards her daughter, seven-year-old Cheryl, and from about six inches away, fired. <laughs> on the case on the night of the attack was forensic expert Jim Pex. One shot was in the back that uh, exited about at the sternum, and that was probably the bullet that was found in, in the passenger side, inside the vehicle. As Cheryl tried to exit the car, her mother leant out of the passenger side door and fired again. There was a, another shot in the lower torso here that stayed in her. After the first bullet is fired, the second and third bullets are fired within seconds. But when a gun is fired in a closed space like a car, it is very loud. I mean, it is booming, shocking, on its own, is stunning, and for children more so. Next down shot her three-year-old son in the back. The boy was on the driver's side back seat, uh, had a single wound, a gunshot wound to the spine. She then shot her daughter, Christy, in the chest twice. As the girl raised her hand to defend herself, a bullet ripped through the thumb of her left hand. There was a bullet penetrating wound that went through her hand, exited near the thumb, and then into her chest. In the back of the car, Christy and Danny were clinging to life. Lying in the footwell in the front, Cheryl was mortally wounded. I suspect that Diane Downs chose to shoot her children because of placing distance mentally and physically between her and them. It's a cold, calculated decision. You don't have to be staring into somebody's eyes to do it. It was a clinical and cruel attack but Downs's evil plan was far from over. While her children lay dying, Diane Downs continued with her coldly conceived plan and covered her tracks. Not only did she know she was gonna kill her children, she knew that she was gonna to have to, in order to make it look like somebody else did it, she was gonna to have to shoot herself. 
so she shot herself in, in the arm. She knew she could probably get away with shooting through the fleshy part of her arm, not do any permanent damage, not break a bone, not incapacitate herself. And then she arranged to take a bandage that she'd already folded up and put in the trunk of her car, it was a large piece of cloth, to wind it around her arm because she had shot herself in her own left arm. Downs then drove the six miles to the Mackenzie Willamette Hospital in Springfield. Gunshot wounds, particularly multiple gunshot wounds, the damage that can be done is tremendous. If it's not destroyed something vital like the heart, then you've got serious problems with ongoing bleeding, and that can be rapidly fatal. A number of minutes could do it. If Downs had driven at top speed, she might have got help for her children in about 10 minutes. But that is not what she did. Realizing the children were still alive, she drove very, very slowly. So slowly that she actually held up traffic. And what's amazing to me, and what makes this a special moment, is here are her children, they've been shot. They're on the literal precipice of death. And, and she's traveling 10 miles an hour to make sure, from her perspective, that they don't get to the hospital on time. And we know this because of witnesses who pulled up behind her on the road, couldn't figure out why is she going so slowly? And because it was such a winding, lonely road, these people had to follow for a long period of time. That represents a sordid departure from her obligations as a mother like I have never seen. That was her last chance to save those children. That was the last chance for her superego, for her moral self to step in and say, I've got to stop. And it didn't happen. And, and that, that made it a truly horrible moment, maybe more horrible than the shooting itself. Because at that point, she proved herself beyond redemption. Downs's peculiar driving continued to attract attention from other cars and their curious passengers. A family that happened to be on the same road had a child in the car. I think he was eight or nine years old. And earlier in the day, they had seen a red automobile with Arizona plates, which happened to be red. He says to his mother, are all the cars from Arizona red? That's the kind of comment a child would make, but it would cement your mind. So they knew that they were following a car they would later identify as Diane Downs' car, who had a red Nissan car with red Arizona license plates on it. Diane Downs pulled into the Springfield Hospital about 30 minutes after she'd shot her children. She finally gets to the hospital. She spills out of the car, says to the emergency room uh, personnel, please save my children. Well, one of them has already died. Uh, the other two uh, were just, just barely saved. Cheryl, the middle daughter, she was dead on arrival at hospital. She had been shot and she had choked on her own blood. She died in pain. Her daughter Christy has also been shot twice, but she's alive. Danny, the son, had been shot once, and he was clinging on to, to life as well. On arrival at hospital, Christy is not even able to speak, so we may have a mixture of direct trauma there, injury to the brain from a stroke, and the shock, the horror of what's happened to her. And she ultimately suffers a stroke, most likely as a result of blood loss, so in her case, it wasn't lethal, but it was totally life-changing. Danny has been shot, and he is paralyzed because of the damage to his spinal cord. Only one member of the family had a bandage on their wounds. She's got these, these three, one fatally injured child in the car, and she, she goes into the hospital. And she is the only one that appears to have a, a dressing. She's the only one who, who appears to have an injury that's been treated. So that suggests to me that actually she's put herself first again. She's made sure that she's okay. She's nursed her own injury whilst her children were in the car dying. Every action Downs took in the wake of the attempted murder of her three children was part of a perverse plot. 
one that painted herself and her family as the victims of a random attack. I think the fact in the case that is the most extraordinary is that after she mustered up whatever courage it took to shoot three of her children, um, she had to create the impression that somehow she was a victim. She wasn't a victim in this case. She was a coldly calculating mother who had decided to eliminate her children as the roadblock between her and her life with this man. Downs had concocted an incredible story about a bushy-haired stranger, a mysterious carjacker who shot her children. Downs claimed she managed to trick the murderous man and drove hell for leather all the way to the hospital in order to save her fatally wounded children. But as the investigation would soon prove, Downs' story was part of a desperate and devious scheme she'd formulated to get away with murder. The Mackenzie Willamette Medical Center, May the 19th, 1983, Springfield, Oregon. So in the hospital, she starts to put aside her version of events. She says that the car was flagged down by a bushy-haired stranger she said had been attacked on a lonely road late at night and she was on her way driving home and she sees a man, her story, and decides to stop. He's signaling for help. According to Downs, when she got out of the car, the bushy-haired man shot her in the arm and then he shot her three children. What didn't make sense is that he would shoot her in the arm, here, not in the head, not in the chest, but shoot her in the arm and then shoot her three children inside the car, blood everywhere. And then she claimed that she had her keys for her car uh, on a ring, kind of like the ring that I have. And she said she pretended to throw it, the way you can say, pretend to throw a ball for your dog. While he's distracted, she jumps in the car, she says, pulls her door shut and manages to drive off, she says, at high speed. I believe she said, I drove like a madwoman. The sensational story that Diane Downs told about the events baffled everyone. The story that didn't make sense at all was that Diane Downs would stop her car, open her door, and get out of the car for this man who she didn't know. But it was not just the odd tale that was troubling. Downs' extraordinary behavior at the hospital also alarmed observers. Well, according to the doctor in charge at the hospital, she was calm, she was quite self-assured, she appeared to be in control of her behavior. She was occasionally laughing, she was occasionally giggling. Staff at the hospital described her reaction as surprising. Danny sustained a shot to the spine, and when his mother was told about this, she seemed to be quite surprised. Oh, so it, it didn't hit him in the heart, suggesting that perhaps that was her intention when she shot him. Again, when she was told of Christie's injuries, she showed little compassion for her injured child. Diane told the doctors that if, if her daughter was gonna have you know, any kind of brain damage, to let her die. This is very unusual. As an, as an immediate response. But it was her daughter Christie's reaction to her own mother that set alarm bells ringing. Diane comes into the room where Christie is in the hospital and she leans over the bed and, and starts saying to Christie, I love you. And from the, the people in the room, they say that Christie looked absolutely terrified. They noticed that her heart rate had gone through the roof when Diane came into the room. So this is a little girl who is very frightened. She's afraid of her mother. And, and this is a, a really clear indication of that. She's scared that her mother is gonna try and harm her again. For one of the children to wake up with the memory that her mother shot her is, it's just indescribable. It, 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 the universe becomes unstable and untrustworthy. The, the sky has fallen. Her attitude and demeanor in the hospital was very unusual uh, for, for the kind of incident that occurred uh, to her own children. And so that was probably one of the first indications 
by the deputy who was there that this, this doesn't look right. As they did not believe Downs's version of the events, investigators quickly identified her as the prime suspect. In the aftermath of this attack, the decision is made to, to remove the children from Diane's care, to, to put them into to foster care. They became wards of the state. So Diane, at this point, has lost her children. The police did not immediately arrest Downs. Instead, they meticulously gathered evidence in the case. State trooper and forensic expert Jim Pex was called the night of the incident. I received a call from the sheriff's office that there had been a shooting and involved a woman and her children, and that uh, there was a need to process a vehicle. Jim Pex closely examined the entire car that night and in daylight the whole of the next day. When he looked at the passenger side door and the areas underneath the car, he made a series of discoveries that would break the case wide open. I spotted a blood stain in the door jam of the passenger door, and the direction was wrong. It, it came from the outside. According to Diane Downs, the bushy-haired man was standing outside the vehicle on the driver's side of the car. But Jim Pex had found that the murdered girl's blood had spattered back onto the door jam on the passenger side of the car, the opposite side to where the bushy-haired man had supposedly attacked. You can see that there is a small blood stain uh, here, so the door was open at the time that this blood stain was created outside the vehicle. The blood spatter meant the victim, in this case seven-year-old Cheryl, was shot at least once when she was outside the car on the passenger side of the vehicle. Strings are used to show the position of the origin of these blood stains from when they traveled through the air and struck the side of the vehicle. Crucially, Jim Pex also found some tiny droplets of blood under the car as well, on the rocker panel, on the passenger side. This particular slide shows the rocker panel that's underneath. You can see on, here, on this lower portion here, there are a number of very small blood stains. These are probably one to two millimeters in size. This discovery led Jim to an irrefutable conclusion. When I found the blood spatter outside the vehicle, that was, uh, you know, something is amiss in this story because that's a long ways away to shoot someone who is very close to the rocker panel. And I knew from the size of the droplets that it was created by someone who's coughing blood or a uh, contact, near contact shot. The muzzle would have to be close to get droplets that were that small. Then you have to stop back and think when the individual uh, the bushy-haired stranger allegedly is standing outside the driver's door. That takes some pretty long arms to get clear over there and outside the passenger door. What Jim Pex did not find further confirmed their suspicions. There were no blood spatters on the driver's side of the car at all. If the bushy-haired man had attacked as Downs had said, Jim would have expected to find blood spatters on the driver's side of the car, but there were none. So the, again, it arouses our suspicions in law enforcement uh, that something is amiss here if someone's not telling the truth. It was clear to Jim Pex and his fellow detectives that whoever shot seven-year-old Cheryl could not have been standing outside the car on the driver's side. The evidence also showed that the shooter fired the gun within inches of the victim's body. And that was significant in her case because one of the children had tried to open the car door to escape, either because Diane Downs was shooting the two kids in the back or because she had already been shot, and fell out of the car, and she was shot again. More evidence uncovered in the car showed how Christy and Danny had been shot and where those shots came from. In looking at the, at the clothing that all of the children had on, I was able to do specific tests to determine how far away the end of the muzzle was from each of them at the time that the shot was fired. 
You can tell both from powder burns, because when, when the bullet is fired, there's a certain amount of, of powder that comes out, and it's still burning. If a gun is fired at very close range to either clothing or to skin, it will cause burning around that that you will not see if somebody is shot from a greater distance. Jim Pex concluded the two children in the back seat had been shot by someone who'd fired from inside the car and from point blank range. Detectives now had proof that Diane Downs's story about a mysterious bushy haired stranger was a lie. Whoever shot the children must have been inside the car when they fired the fatal shots. The physical evidence, the blood splatter evidence did not conform to the way she described the crime. So it became pretty apparent pretty quickly that she was the perpetrator. Meanwhile, Diane Downs was left free to talk to the press and protest her innocence. It was decided to go ahead and continue to let her talk because we knew there was a relationship to her with this shooting. And so she, she continued to uh, harangue law enforcement and imply that we're looking at her and that we weren't looking for the bushy-haired stranger. Yeah, she was right, we weren't. Downs was now the only suspect in the murder of her daughter, Cheryl, and the attempted murder of her other two children, Christy and Danny. All three had been shot at night in the family car on a lonely country road after a day out. When forensic expert Jim Pex found spent bullet cases inside the car, he determined that all the victims had been shot with a 22 caliber semi-automatic weapon. So they issued a warrant and searched Diane Downs' house in Springfield. The police are quite surprised at what they find. This does not look like a family home. This looks like the home of a rather narcissistic single woman. So there are three pictures on top of the television stand of Diane. Also, one of the things that the police find is a, a unicorn, which appears to be a kind of memorial to the children. It has their, their names on it and a date on it. But surprisingly, this wasn't something that Diane came to acquire after the attack. It's something that was already there before. So she's memorializing her children even before they're dead. The question becomes, how can a mother maim two of her children and kill another child and live with herself? And the answer is, she can live with herself only if the only thing in her universe was her narcissism and herself. Her children don't exist. They, from her perspective, was an obstruction between her and her new love. Beyond that, they were nothing. When the detectives found Downs's diary, her motivation for attempting to murder her three children was eerily clear. In that diary, she talks an awful lot about the co-worker that she's become incredibly fixated on. And it becomes quite clear to police that this relationship with him is the reason that she's tried to kill her children, was because they were the barrier, they were the obstacle that was standing in the way of her relationship with him. During the search, the police also found a 22 caliber rifle and their hopes were piqued. It was certainly suspicious it's a 22 rifle. So, you know, is this potentially the murder weapon? We took the rifle back to the crime laboratory. I test fired the rifle and compared the, the tool marks created by the rifle to the cartridge casings that were found at the scene. They were different. So the rifle was not used in the commission of this crime. But the unspent bullets found in the magazine cartridge did provide a vital clue that would help solve the case. Even though the marks on the cartridges from the rifle didn't match test fires that I performed with the rifle, they had the same extractor marks on them as the casings that I retrieved from the vehicle. The extractor marks are made on the soft shell casing when a bullet is ejected from the barrel of a gun. The way the gun gets rid of that bullet is a thing called an ejector, 
as that gun cycles, pulls the shell back and then kicks it out of a port and, and it's gone and then chambers another round. Let's say you have a pistol that's already loaded and you decide I wanna unload the gun. You would then release the magazine, that's all the other bullets, and then, pointing it in a safe direction, you pull the slide and when you pull it back, it will take the unfired bullet, so bullet and shell, and kick it out of the gun. She had apparently done this, had cycled some rounds of ammunition through the gun, and they had ejector marks on them. Even within the same brand, make, model, and year of a gun, those ejector marks are somewhat unique. Even if you had two identical Ruger pistols, the ejector marks will be slightly different. They're imperfections in manufacturing of the gun. Uh, there'll be small differences, but there will be differences. Jim Pex placed two 22 caliber bullets side by side under a comparison microscope. One ejected by Downs's rifle and the other one that was found inside the crime scene car. What you have is a split image down the middle and what we're looking at are extractor marks. And as you can see by the fine striations here, these extractor marks were both made by the same extractor which means there is a relationship between the cartridge casings from the crime scene and the cartridges from her apartment. Then we knew that this is a breakthrough moment where there is a relationship to the fired casings that hit the children to the cartridges that were inside the tubular magazine of the rifle. Checking sales records, police knew that Diane Downs had owned a Ruger 22 caliber semi-automatic pistol. After test firing one exhaustively, Jim Pex found similar extractor marks on the bullet casings. He concluded that a Ruger 22 caliber pistol was the murder weapon, but it was never found. While Diane Downs managed to dispose of the gun, but at home she had a rifle that also shot 22 caliber rounds. And when the police processed this evidence, they found that they were the same manufacturer as the bullets that were used to shoot her children. They had ejector marks on them, some of them, that were the same as the ejector marks from the pistol. The bullet casings and their telltale extractor marks were enough to convict Diane Downs for the murder and attempted murder of her three children. On February the 28th, 1984, nine months after the crime, she was brought into custody. When the arrest finally went down, I think the whole town breathed a sigh of relief. She appeared at the Lane County Courthouse for her arraignment. After the charges were read, Diane Downs sprung a major surprise. Her attorney stands up and after he's finished all the legal arguments, says, and besides your honor, my client is pregnant and it would be bad for her health to go to jail. I was sitting in that courtroom seat. You could hear the entire room take a big deep breath. It was stunning, just absolutely stunning. According to rumors, the father was a local reporter. There was one reporter that had sex with her, and I can tell you this, it wasn't me. And she became pregnant from that. But she loved the attention that she got. By the time the trial began on May the 8th, 1984, Downs was eight months pregnant. Obviously, she was pregnant at the time of the trial, and, and this was something that I think she thought would help her garner quite a bit of sympathy. Her antics, however, were not enough to fool the jury. A mountain of evidence went a long way to convincing them of Diane Downs's culpability in the crime. Then her surviving daughter, Christy, took to the stand. This little girl had to have been under so much strain and stress. Her mother's tried to kill her. She's living with a new family. Her sister is dead. Her brother's in a wheelchair for the rest of his life. And now she has to sit in front of a room full of strangers and talk about the most difficult night of her life. She gets up on the stand, and when the, the, the person asks her the question, who shot you and your siblings, she says, my mum did it. 
This was one of those moments in court where everything is dead still, nobody dares breathe. Christy laid out how her mother first shot Cheryl, then turned and shot Danny in the back, then shot her twice in the chest. The testimony just tore your heart apart. This wasn't the critical piece of information. There was lots of physical evidence of what Diane Downs had done. But I think this was essential in making sure that Diane Downs was convicted of the crime she committed. On June the 17th, 1984, the jury found Diane Downs guilty of the murder of her seven-year-old daughter, Cheryl, and the attempted murder of her daughter, Christy, and son, Danny. She was sentenced to life in prison plus 50 years. Ten days after she was found guilty, Diane gave birth to a baby girl. The child was immediately given up for adoption. At the same time, the prosecutor in the case, Fred Hughey, adopted the two children who survived their mother's attack. After the trial was over, Fred adopted the two children. And he did a wonderful job of raising those two kids. So I admire him for that. That was a lifetime commitment to be the father and his wife, the mother, to these children that they really deserved and that Diane Downs denied to them. In prison, Diane Downs managed another surprise. On July the 11th, 1987, three years after her incarceration, she escaped. She got out of the prison easy as pie, climbed the fence. She was loose for more than a week and she was only about 10 blocks away. She was staying with some men. Later, one of the men said he thought she was trying to get pregnant. Diane Downs, the mother who tried to kill her three children, was returned to prison, where to this day she protests her innocence. I can tell you that for all the stories I've covered, Diane Downs stands out because this woman was pure evil. She did something that's unheard of. She violated that sacred duty uh, and attempted in cold blood to kill all three of her children for no other reason than to increase her chances at having a particular boyfriend. I don't think there is anything worse than, than this kind of betrayal by your own mother. Your, your mother is the, the one that should nurture you, should protect you. The cold-hearted murder of her daughter, Cheryl, and the attempted murder of her two other young children, Christy and Danny, makes Diane Downs one of the world's most evil killers. November the 30th, 1989, Central Florida, when a 51-year-old male picked up a prostitute from the side of the road, he had no idea that she would turn out to be a cold-blooded killer. She was just utterly remorseless. This was somebody who enjoyed watching men die. She shot him four times with a nine-shot revolver. In her mass murder spree, hardened killer Eileen Warnos targeted middle-aged wealthy men with expensive cars. She killed still. There was no sympathy, no... She was just a ruthless, mean bitch. Very few women have ever killed in such a violent and vile manner in history. Eventually, she was recorded confessing with the help of her girlfriend. Why the hell did you do this? Why did you do this? In just one year, this female serial killer callously shot, robbed, and murdered seven men, making Eileen Warnos one of the world's most evil killers. Daytona Beach, Florida, 
It was here that sex worker Eileen Warnos went on a murderous rampage between November 1989 and November 1990. Her actions left locals fearing for their lives. Warnos shot and killed at point-blank range seven men between 1989 and 1990. Here is somebody who is deliberately targeting men who are looking to engage in the services of a sex worker and she is killing them and robbing them and disposing of their bodies. Detective David Taylor was on the police task force that was instrumental in bringing Warnos to justice. It shocked the community that once we identified Alien Warnos as the killer of these men, that a female was that vicious in killing these people. About nine in 10 serial killers are men and one in 10 are women. Female serial killers tend to use quite remote methods like poisoning, but Muernos literally went and picked victims as they drove past her on the highway. It's very rare to have a female serial killer, but it's even rarer to have one that kills in the way that Muernos did. She essentially killed like a man. Mike Joyner was an undercover police officer on the Wernos case and was key to her arrest. She would be on the side of the road and prostitute, and she would pick up men as they stopped to help her. Uh, and then she would take them somewhere and kill them and take their money or take whatever value they had. Detective Brian Jarvis was also on the Warnos task force, and he recalls the impact her killing spree had on Florida. At this particular time, because of the way the bodies were found, the way things turned up, there, there was a lot of panic all over this. To have a, a serial killer on the loose is something that is going to have an impact on any community. Everybody in Florida uses the highways. Everybody feels that they have that connection to this case. This killer's story begins in 1956. Eileen Warnos was born on the 29th of February in Rochester, Michigan. Her mother was just 16 years old when she gave birth and was unable to raise her. By March 1960, when Eileen's just four, she's formally adopted by her mother's parents, her grandparents. She had a really brutal upbringing with them, so she was regularly beaten by her grandfather. There were allegations of incest within the family. Her grandfather had a home-built sauna in his house, and if he wanted to punish her for doing something he didn't like, he'd lock her in the sauna and crank up the heat and just let her stay in there. Eileen's abusive childhood sent her on a downward spiral and fueled her hatred of men. This was somebody who was constantly in fear. Wernos's grandfather allegedly repeatedly said to her that she was worthless, that she should never have been born, that she was a mistake. So she's learning that she can't trust anyone, that she can't depend upon anybody. And this is very, very dangerous. Eileen learned early to use any means available to survive. Before she got to her teen years, uh, she was known as a cigarette bandit. She would trade sexual favors for packs of cigarettes. It's said that from around age 11, she's using her body as something to trade, as a tool. And this kind of disconnection from her emotions is something that, that is going to have a significant impact on the rest of her life. Her behavior left her pregnant, aged 14. Now, on the orders of her grandfather, that baby is adopted. It's taken away from her. And this is just reinforcing those ideas that, that she already has, that those who are supposed to love me hurt me, that I am worthless, that I'm not deserving of love. Shortly after she was forced to give up her child, Eileen was hit by another tragedy. Her grandmother dies of liver failure, having been quite a heavy drinker for many years. Her grandfather actually blames her for her grandmother's death. Her grandfather was furious and threw Warnos out of the house. Aged just 15, Warnos was left homeless. Alone, her only option was to live in the woods at the end of their street. 
She lives a very feral existence, sleeping in an old car, and she's still a child at this point. And, and this is incredibly damaging. There is absolutely nobody there for her. She is literally just taking each day as it comes. She's making sure that she has enough to eat. Um, she is, is basically using her body as she's used it before. She's learning that life is full of rejection, it's full of pain, it's full of fear, and that she really needs to hurt others before they get the chance to hurt her. One person she was still close to was her brother, Keith. Just 11 months older than Eileen, the rumor was that their relationship was an unnatural one. There were allegations of incest. Um, school friends of Keith said that they'd witnessed these things going on. So she felt a connection, but it was a very pathological and a very toxic one. Unable to cope living outside during the cold winter months in Michigan, age 16, Eileen hitchhiked over a thousand miles west to the warmer climes of Colorado. Two years later, she was arrested for her first offense, driving under the influence and disorderly conduct, which included the dangerous discharge of a 22 caliber weapon. Eventually, in 1976, age 20, she hitchhiked 2,000 miles southeast to sunny Florida. It is no accident that very shortly after she gets to Florida, she falls in love with, or at least decides to marry, a 69-year-old man called Louis Gratz Fell. He was president of the Yacht Club, but it was a doomed marriage. She's been incredibly violent towards him. Eileen was actually beating him up. She was hitting him with his own walking cane. Lewis put a restraining order on Warnos and filed for annulment just weeks after they were married. While the proceedings were going through, Eileen received some devastating family news. In 1976, her brother Keith dies of throat cancer and she's absolutely beside herself. And even though their relationship was an incredibly abnormal and dysfunctional one, she felt that she had an ally in him. But now she was completely on her own. Eileen received $10,000 when her brother died. She spends it almost within weeks. Guns, cars, motel rooms. And then she decides she has to sustain this lifestyle and turns to armed robbery to do it. In 1981, she was arrested for stealing $35 and two packets of cigarettes from a convenience store. Warnos spent over a year in jail, but that didn't deter her. Over the next decade, her criminal activity escalated. She really did demonstrate versatility. She was being arrested for driving under the influence, for assault and battery, for, for robbery. One man claimed when she was a uh, prostitute again that she whipped a gun out and put it to his head and demanded $200. She was, to put it politely, out of control. In 1986, Warnos met a woman who changed her life. When she met Tyree, what, what Aileen thought, this is my soulmate. This is the person I want to spend the rest of my life with, and I will do anything for this girl. The owner of the Last Resort Bar in Daytona Beach, Al Bulling, remembers Warnos well, who was a regular customer. She used to come in here. She'd shoot pool here with her girlfriend, Ty. She was, uh, she was a little mouthy with Eileen. If she needed a beer, she'd sit on a pool table and kind of demand her, get her another beer or whatever. Having blown her inheritance, Warnos took it upon herself to raise the money the two needed to live. Aileen would go out and prostitute to make money so that she could buy things for Tyria. She would want to take care of her and make sure she was happy and, and never want to leave her. And I think that was what it boiled down to. Daytona Beach, Florida, November the 30th, 1989. 33-year-old Eileen Warnos was now living with lover Tyria Moore and was indulging in a host of petty crimes to maintain their extravagant lifestyle. The frequency of the crimes and the force Warnos used to enact them was increasing. It all came to a head the night she was picked up by 51-year-old Richard Mallory. 
Richard Mallory owned an electrical repair shop and he'd been divorced for, for many years and he didn't make any secret of the fact that he did enjoy engaging in the services of sex workers. He picked her up hitchhiking, they were drinking, they were hanging out as it were and one thing led to another, uh, some type of violent encounter where she ended up killing him. She shot him four times with a nine shot revolver. She took a couple of pieces of property that belonged to him, a camera and a radar detector, and she pawned them. She made some money off of the deal. When Richard Mallory's body was found two weeks after he was killed, there was no evidence to clarify what sparked her rage. His body was found, it was, it was very decomposed. Basically, all we have to work with is what we have found at the crime scene, the physical evidence and the trace evidence, etc. We do know that he was shot multiple times and his victim was found in a secluded area right outside the city of Daytona. What triggered Warnos to kill for the first time remains a mystery. But what is certain is that the murder of Richard Mallory was the beginning of a dark and deadly chapter. For her entire life, Wernos has been victimized by men. She's been abused by them. But now she's turned the tables. She's the one that's in control and she's very much enjoying it because she's learned from a very early age that violence equals power. And she really is on quite a high at this point. Taking one life once wasn't enough. Six months later, Warner struck again. There's usually a, what they call a brief cooling off period. And this absolutely applied here. Large part of it was due to her paranoia and her fear of, of getting caught. And, and when she came back from that brief cooling off period, now she was the predator. She was looking for who she was going to kill next. She's somebody who's being proactive. She's seeking out victims, she's getting access to them, she has an opportunity to harm them, and she takes that opportunity. These men, they were all white males. They were all traveling the roads alone. They were middle-aged, 40 to 65. On May the 19th, 1990, she was picked up on the I-75 highway by a 43-year-old machine operator, David Spears. When they pulled over and he began to undress, she slipped out of the passenger side door, walked around to the driver's side, aimed and fired. He'd been shot six times. One shot was not enough for Warnos. She was making a point with her killings. She was saying, this is for all the men who have abused me over the years. This was somebody who enjoyed watching men die because for the first time in her life, she was powerful. She was the one in control. She was the one calling the shots. David was last seen by his son leaving work at midday to meet his ex-wife. When he didn't show up, his family reported him missing. Our patrol division had come upon a vehicle that was abandoned on I-75. It was in the southbound lane on the shoulder. It had a flat tire. And when they ran the VIN number on the vehicle, it came back to David Spears, who had been reported a missing person. We searched the area. We secured the vehicle to process it. And we found that she had taken some stuff out of the vehicle and tossed it off the side of the road into the, the weeds. The items included the license plate or the tag from the car. David Spears' body was found less than two weeks later, dumped in Citrus County, a few miles from the I-75 highway. May the 31st, Warnos went on the prowl again. In Pasco County, Florida, 40-year-old Charles Cascaden, a part-time rodeo rider, picked up Warnos about 30 minutes north of Tampa. He was traveling back from St. Louis. He had been up there visiting his mother, and he drove back from St. Louis to the Tampa area where he was living with his fiance. And just before he got to Tampa, he encountered Aileen. Eileen had developed a deadly routine. Once a man picked her up, his fate was sealed. They would drive away and she'd be undressing and they'd find her a remote location. She'd encourage the victim to also remove his clothes. As Charles undressed, Warnos slipped out of the car and came round to the driver's side door. 
Then, at point-blank range, she fired. She didn't just kill. She shot Charles Cascadon nine times. Once she was sure he was dead, she took his car and his possessions. She didn't do that with Richard Mallory. She just took items she could use. Now she's starting to gather those, those souvenirs and those trophies, and, and uh, it's becoming a passion of hers to do this stuff. She then dumped Charles's body a few miles from the highway in Pasco County. She left these victims basically in the middle of nowhere. And to do that to another human being, there's zero compassion. She's pure evil. Just a week after her last killing, the deadly predator was on the hunt again. On June the 7th, Warnos chose to work her favorite highway, the I-75 in central Florida. After three murders, she'd honed her technique. Warnos's victims were all men who drove expensive cars, so they were the, the symbol of success. That night, Christian missionary Peter Sims, aged 65, left his home in Jupiter, Florida, and was driving north on the I-75. Peter Sims was on a road trip, and he never made it to his destination. His intent was to drive up to New Jersey, and from there he had planned on going over to Arkansas. He had a number of Bibles in the car with him. He was going to pass them out along the way. Instead, for some unknown reason, Peter Sims picked up Eileen Wuornos. He could not have thought of as a more upright character. He also took part in an outreach Christian ministry. But I think that that infuriated Wuornos because she thought, you hypocrite, I'm going to kill you. And she duly did. <laughs> The following month, the car was found in the Ocala National Forest, 50 miles west of Daytona Beach. The evidence discovered would point to Warnos as the terrifying serial killer targeting middle-aged men across the Sunshine State. Daytona Beach, Florida, July 1990. Eileen Warnos was living in a local motel with her girlfriend, Tyria Moore. In under seven months, the serial killer had callously shot, murdered, and robbed four men. In what was by now a sadistic pattern, when each of the middle-aged men pulled over and picked her up, the 34-year-old sex worker attacked. She was just utterly remorseless. She didn't just shoot them once, she'd shoot them three times, four times, five times. They had all been shot with a small caliber weapon, namely a 22. And another trait that these victims shared was that they had all been robbed of their personal effects. Uh, their pants pockets pulled inside out, their personal ID was missing, and their vehicles was missing as well. On July the 4th, 1990, the car belonging to 65-year-old Peter Sims was found abandoned in the Ocala National Forest in Orange Springs, an hour's drive from Daytona Beach. Now, this is interesting because his body has never been discovered. The only way we know that he's dead is that his car was taken by Moore and Wuornos and driven around. Aileen and Tyria had decided that they wanted to go see the fireworks in Daytona Beach. As they were driving, they noticed a sign that indicated there was an Indian reservation up in the Ocala Forest. They turned around and Tyria was going just a little bit too fast. She went off the road, the car turned on its passenger side and slid. The engine had stalled out, the carburetor had flooded, they couldn't get it started. The witness reported the suspicious encounter to Marion County Police Department in Florida, who went to investigate. Now, the one thing that was important to note here was that was the first time somebody actually saw these girls. We had received a telephone call through our 911 center that a vehicle had crashed in the community of Orange Springs, Florida. And walking away from that vehicle were two women. When they got to the scene, the investigators searched the car and made note of its distinct condition. The license plate had been removed. 
the driver's side seat was in the forwardmost position, and we would find that certain things were missing from his vehicle. In this case, it was his receipt book and, and cash. So at this point, we have another missing person. We have no idea what happened to him. Using the VIN number on the vehicle, the car was soon identified as belonging to missing person Peter Sims. We searched the areas extensively. I don't know if it was for days or weeks, but it was a long time that we spent up there looking for Peter Sims' body, looking for any type of evidence. The police found a series of pawn shop tickets in the car. When they tracked down the store, they made a major breakthrough in the case. One pawn ticket we found was for a box of tools, and that's what was one of the things that was stolen from David Spears. The other pawn ticket we found was for a 35 millimeter camera and a radar detector. That's what was stolen from Richard Mallory. They submitted the car to forensic examination and made an important discovery on the driver's side door handle. Wuornos leaves a palm print in Seams' car, which will eventually become extremely significant. Wuornos would pawn many of the items that she stole from her victims in order to, to get some fast money. And her fingerprints would still be on these items. Now, because Eileen had such a significant criminal record, her fingerprints were on file, and it was only going to be a matter of time before they were matched up and she was connected to these murders. But before the police could piece the puzzle together, Wuornos struck again. It became very frustrating and I can remember even at times thinking, are we gonna be able to solve this? Are we gonna be able to come up with something? And every time we got another body, it, it mounted, it, it, you know, it, it got worse. On July the 30th, 1990, Wuornos selected her fifth victim, a 50-year-old salesman called Troy Burris. Troy Burris, he had gone out to do a delivery run. And when he got to Daytona, he headed north up into Ormond Beach, made a few stops up there, turned around when he was returning to the plant, he disappeared. On the way back to Daytona, he picked up Eileen. Like previous victims, Troy pulled up at a secluded spot. Minutes later, Warner shot him twice at point blank range. Fifty year old Troy's body was found five days later. One of our deputies came upon his truck and it had been abandoned at the intersection of State Route 40 and 19, very isolated area. A month later, she took her sixth life. On September the 12th, 1990, 56-year-old retired police chief Charles Dick Humphreys was coming off the I-75 when he picked up Eileen Warnos. They drove to a deserted location a few miles off the highway in southwestern Marion County and pulled over. David Taylor was the homicide detective called to the scene. The evidence is consistent with Mr. Humphreys getting out of the vehicle from the driver's side. We're looking at Alien Warnos getting out from the passenger side. And it was at that point that shots rang out. So Mr. Humphreys is shot several times. He staggers over to this location, and that's where Mr. Humphreys collapses. But what was so important to us was the fact that he was shot one time at a close non-contact range, meaning that the gun was held only just a few inches away from his chest when that round was fired. Werner shot Charles Humphreys multiple times. She's using much more violence than she needs to get the job done. It shows to me that she's enjoying this overkill. It's not enough to kill him. She has to destroy this individual. And this is somebody whose behavior is escalating. By the autumn of that year, investigators were still unable to identify the killer and stop the murders. By the time Mr. Humphreys was killed, we had thought about there being a connection. So we had contacted every agency in Central Florida, whether it was on a local, state, or federal level, because we didn't know anything. We were, we were almost in the dark on this, and it was very frustrating. Officers revisited the evidence from the previous six murder cases, searching for clues. 
And it wasn't more than just a couple weeks later when Sergeant Brian Jarvis was actually going through other cases in Florida that had very similar MOs, such as an older white male shot multiple times, vehicle missing, and shot with a small caliber weapon. And it was Brian uh, that began to connect a couple dots. By winter of 1990, a task force was formed made up of detectives from several of Florida's counties. We actually all met at the Marion County Sheriff's Office. That's when this picture began to evolve. Nah, there's a possibility these cases could be related. While the police continued their investigation, Warnos was free to kill again. The most important thing on our minds at that point is we got to stop the killing. We have to do something to stop the killing. And then we started with the task force, and we had another body. It was, it was devastating. She kills Walter Gino Antonio, a man of 62, who was found in a logging uh, road. He'd been shot four times in the back and the head. And his car had been stolen. Antonio's abandoned car was found five days later, just south of Daytona Beach in Brevard County. Walter Gino Antonio was a reserve deputy sheriff with the Brevard County Sheriff's Office. And some of the things that were taken from him, personal effects, were like a set of handcuffs and a flashlight. For the task force, another murder was a mighty blow. It's like, why couldn't we do more? You know, how could we let this happen? It's kind of a personal blame. And uh, it's, what can we do? The task force refocused on the case of missing man Peter Sims, hoping to find clues that would lead them to the killer. We were perplexed with that case because we had not located his body, but he was a middle-aged white male. The biggest piece of evidence in that case was we had eyewitnesses that seen these two females leaving the scene of that crash. After interviewing the witnesses, the police were able to draw a composite sketch of the two women, and that changed everything. I think the eureka moment came the first time we went public. Within the first hour of releasing these composites, we had a call that came in. It was item number five, our fifth lead, that named Tyria and Aileen. And in very short sequence, we had three other leads come in that also named the same girls. So now we knew there was something to that. Those leads eventually took us to some biker bars. Now we have undercover investigators that are now going from bar to bar looking for people that look familiar with the people in, in the composite sketches. One of the undercover officers sent to find the suspected serial killer was Mike Joyner. I was the lieutenant over a special investigation unit, the SIU unit. They called me in to a meeting and said that they had found out that she was staying in Daytona or close to Daytona and wanted me to go over there and see if I could find her in some of those biker bars over there and maybe, you know, get close to her. Daytona Beach, Florida, January 1991. After callously shooting and murdering seven men, the net was finally closing in on a cruel serial killer, Eileen Warnos. She is a woman who took pleasure in not only killing, but also robbing her victims. Wernos is targeting adult men, and she's a sex worker. It's normally the sex workers who are vulnerable victims of their clients. So she looks very different. She kills like a man. She is right in front of them, watching them die, and really quite enjoying it. 34-year-old Warnos did not know it yet, but she was about to meet her destiny in Daytona Beach. After a composite sketch was released to the public, dozens of leads came in, and Eileen Warnos was identified as the prime suspect. When we reviewed the leads, it showed us that they had ties to the locations that we were looking at. It indicated that they'd gone inland, which would have been Marion County, and then to the East Coast, which was 
Daytona Beach. So a number of the undercover officers from all over the state that we were working with went over to Daytona Beach in an attempt to locate her. Within a couple of days, she was found by undercover police officer Mike Joyner. I walked in a bar down there, and uh, I saw her. She was shooting pool, and I recognized her. And she had a bad scar on her forehead. Did my heart go to racing and beating? No. An undercover officer, worst enemy he had can be himself if he don't control his emotions. So I just ordered another beer and kept on working. But I knew I had her. And I knew I wasn't gonna let it out of my sight. Mike spent three days following Warner around the biker bars in the area. In his bid to get close to her, he even slept at her favorite hangout, the last resort. And they had school buses, seats, all on the back porch. And that's where I slept, was on the school bus. And when they opened the bar up at 7 o'clock, you went back inside and went drinking again and shooting pool. I mean, that's all you're doing. You shot pool and drank beer. And she had no money, and I had all the money, so who was she going to stay the closest to? Which got nowhere from then on, I had to. And I started buying her beer and playing pool, and you kind of hung together. With the task force secretly stationed outside, on January the 9th, 1991, Mike Joyner made his move. We were in the bar. We were dancing, and uh, I had a lot of money, and that's what she was interested in. And uh, she wanted to know if I wanted to go out and one night and party. And I told her, I said, uh, yeah, I'd love to go out, but I said, you stink. You ain't had a bath. And I don't know when, and I said, I stink. And I said, I ain't doing that. I'll go, I'll go get a motel room and we'll clean up, but I ain't going out with no stinking ass woman. Mike told Warnos to wait for him at the bar while he went to get his room key. Instead, he met with a task force outside. And I meet with my outside people and tell them, you know, we make a plan because we knew what she had in mind. The exact words I told them was, piss on the fire and call in the dogs. This hunt's over with. This is her. And I'm not going off with her because I'm not going to be the next victim. Mike returned to the bar with a motel key and showed it to Wernos. He then waited for her to make the next move. Could I get worried about it? No, she wasn't going to kill me in the bar. I wasn't, you know, I really wasn't worried about it, not at that point. I just went and got another beer and said, just whenever you get ready, I'm ready to go, let's go. A little while later, Warnas and the undercover cop walked out of the bar. The owner of the last resort, Al Bulling, was an eyewitness to what happened next. They were just sitting at the bar drinking, you know. They didn't want to arrest her in the bar or anything because they didn't know what she had or didn't want nobody else getting hurt. So they waited for her to walk out the door. As soon as they hit the door, that's when they arrested her. Wernus was bundled into a car and taken away. The task force had successfully executed the arrest safely. I wasn't worried about my safety because I had the best backup in the world. It was a relief. I think that's the best way to describe it as a relief. The next day, investigators managed to track down Wernos's partner, Tyria Moore, in Scranton, Pennsylvania. And they said to her, let's make a, a deal. If you can provide evidence, if you can help us convict Eileen Wernos, then we will give you immunity from prosecution. So I think this, this was a very, very tempting offer. Tyria agreed to call Eileen and let the police record their conversations. Lee, they're coming after me. I know they are. No, they're not. What? Mm. OK. Yes. Why the hell did you do this? Why did you do this? 
Hi. Wait. I probably never be able to see you. <laughs> yes. I love you. <sighs> if I have to confess everything just to keep you from getting in trouble, I will. Okay. The same month she was arrested, Eileen Warnos fully confessed to the seven murders. Well, I came here to confess. I'm honest, Miss J, I one thing right there and now. Sure. The reason I'm confessing is there's not another girl. There is no girl. Okay, so then what you're telling us is you're voluntarily coming forward to talk to us now. Yeah, to let you know that I'm the one that did the charge. Despite the seriousness of her crimes, Warnos refused an attorney. Well, I was an attorney going to do. I know what I did. I'm confessing what I did. So I But in what was the cornerstone of her defense, she claimed that in each case, the men had tried to rape her. is trying to look out for herself. She's still trying to perform this role as the victim because I think she's more than familiar with the fact that many sex workers are regularly raped and assaulted by their clients. And I think she's trying to garner a bit of sympathy for herself in, in doing this. I don't know what to do. I know that I don't want my girlfriend involved because this is why I'm doing this. They've been talking to her parents in Texas her trial for first-degree murder started a year later on January the 13th, 1992, at the Volusia County Courthouse near Daytona. It was an extraordinary defence. After all, she could simply have reported them to the police. But she didn't do that. She took the law into her own hands and indeed executed them herself. Muernos is a simmering pot of resentment, and it's not enough that she's killed her victims, but she wants to make them suffer after they've died. She wants to tarnish their reputations. So she says that her victims picked her up, they targeted her, they were the predators, not her. In an unusual twist, Muernos was only tried for her first murder, that of 51-year-old Richard Mallory. Florida State Attorney John Tanner was the lead prosecutor. In Florida, if you have a series of crimes that are related in certain factors, then you may be able to bring in evidence of those other crimes, and in this case, it was murder. Called the Williams Rule, John Tanner was able to draw a link between the seven murders. Each of these killings looked almost identical, showing, I think, basically that this appeared to be the print of the same killer. And it certainly challenged the theory that she was simply defending herself against rape. When you're saying that everyone that picked me up tried to rape me, and credibility is, uh, becomes a real issue. On January the 27th, 1992, Eileen Warnos was found guilty of the murder of Richard Mallory and sentenced to death. Then she pulled a major surprise. One of the odd twists of this whole thing. After being sentenced for Richard Mallory's death, she elected to plead guilty for five other counts of first degree murder, and she accepted the death penalty without going to trial. She really just wanted to get it over with. She didn't want to go to trial again, and she didn't want to face Tyria. By November 1992, Wernos had been given a total of six death sentences. She was never charged with the murder of Peter Sims, as his body was never found. After 10 years of appeals and litigation, she finally met her fate. Very close to the end of her life, she said, I have hate crawling through my system. I'm competent, 
sane and trying to tell the truth. I'm one who seriously hates human life and I would kill again. Eileen Warnas was executed by lethal injection on October the 9th, 2002. Her reactions were a typical Eileen. She was verbal. She was discussing something about uh, the mother ships ready to blast off, uh, that she would be back again one day, and here we go. I've told a lot of people that when we stop talking about Bonnie and Clyde, that'll probably be the same day we quit talking about Aileen Warnos. Some people believe that she was an abuse victim, that she was very childlike, vulnerable. Other people feel that she was a sadistic killer. She enjoyed ending men's lives. In reality, it was probably a bit of both, and that's why we continue to be fascinated by her. In just one year, she callously killed seven men in cold blood and then robbed them. She had a record unmatched by any other female killer. The violent nature of her multiple murders makes Eileen Warnos one of the world's most evil killers. In April 1991, doctors at Grantham and Kesteven Hospital in Lincolnshire were perplexed. In just two months, the health of 13 children on Ward 4 had mysteriously deteriorated. Four of them had died. Sadly, I had to share with the parents and said, look, this is impossible, but I can't do anything more. I felt so sad. He died in my hands. But this was no unfortunate coincidence. I began to realize that there was a serial killer that was working on that ward and was causing the collapses of, of these children. Unbelievably, one of the nurses was deliberately attempting to kill her young patients by injecting them with deadly poison. The sergeant walked in and then he said, um, we have reason to believe that Paul's um, illness, hypoglycemic sex, were a result of a maladministration of drugs. And I remember my words exactly. That would explain a lot, wouldn't it? Beverly Allitt, the woman dubbed the Angel of Death, had without doubt become one of the world's most evil killers. It was a case that shocked the world. For 59 days in 1991, there was a serial killer stalking the children's ward at Grantham and Kesteven Hospital in Lincolnshire. But nobody knew it. 22-year-old nurse Beverly Allitt's job was to protect the children in her care, but she abused her role. She was purposely harming them. Her crimes were horrific and ruined the lives of many, including the families of her innocent victims. As a judge said to take her down, there were emotional scenes in the public gallery with families bursting into tears. One woman jumped up shouting, bastard, bastard. Another shouted, lock her in a cage. Beverly Allitt had tried to get away with murder. Her story begins over two decades earlier. Beverly Allitt was born on the 4th of October 1968 in the small Lincolnshire village of Corby Glen. She was one of four children. There don't seem to be any real red flags in, in Beverly Allitt's background that, that would suggest that she'd go on to do the things she did. So normally when we, we have a serial killer, we have an abusive or a violent childhood. There's something that's there in the background, but with Beverly Allitt, there doesn't seem to be any real powerful explanatory factor. Fast forward to April 1991. 22-year-old Beverly Allitt had been working on the children's ward at Grantham and Kesteven Hospital for three months. One of the consultants on Ward 4 was Dr. Charith Nani Yakara. My first impressions about Beverly Allitt was nothing outstanding. She was just another quiet, pleasant, obliging nurse who was available. During Alit's short time on the ward, three children had died suddenly. 
and a further nine had fallen seriously ill under suspicious circumstances. On April the 22nd, 1991, Beverly Allett was on duty when 15-month-old Claire Peck was admitted to Ward 4. She was under the care of the two consultants at the hospital, Dr. Frederick Porter and Dr. Nana Yakara. Claire Peck, she had come with a severe attack of asthma, breathing difficulties, requiring oxygen. So Dr. Porter was called and he had come. He had tried to resuscitate and provide all the necessary care as appropriate. And Beverly Allett on this occasion had been with him. In spite of all the efforts taken, Dr. Porter couldn't resuscitate her and she had died within hours. Claire Peck was the fourth child to die unexpectedly at Grantham and Kesteven Hospital in three months. It was an alarming number in such a short space of time. I said, I really don't know what's going on. And got together with Dr. Porter and the senior nursing manager and checked through all the cases of worrying suspicions and anxieties we had. I compiled a report and sent it to unit general manager, saying we have series of these unexplained and sometimes explained collapses. We are very worried about these problems and therefore we want to bring it to your notice. We need your help. On the 30th of April, the hospital decided to ask the police to investigate the deaths to see if there could be something or someone casting a shadow over Ward 4. The case found its way to Chief Superintendent Stuart Clifton. One of my detective sergeants at Grantham contacted me to say that he'd had a call from Grantham Hospital which suggested that they'd had a high number of collapses of children which may or may not be down to some criminal act. When I use the term collapsed, I'm talking in terms of each of them having stopped breathing and the resuscitation team, known colloquially as the crash team, were, were called to resuscitate the children. There were two paediatricians employed at the hospital, a Dr. Porter and Dr. Nanyakara, who had differing opinions about whether the collapses of children at, at that hospital over a period of about three months were actually uh, medically related or whether they were at the hands of somebody who was causing those collapses. After a meeting between detectives and doctors on the 3rd of May, it was decided they'd ask Professor David Hull, an expert in paediatrics, to give his insight on each of the cases. He set out in some detail his findings but concluded by saying, of the 13 children that I've looked at, I think that there are only three that are worthy of further investigation. In two of these cases, I feel that there will be a medical explanation. And in one case, a little boy called Paul Crampton, I think it's worthy of further investigation. Five-month-old Paul Crampton had been admitted to Ward 4 on the 20th of March 1991 with a chest infection. His dad, David, remembers it well. Paul was actually born with um, uh, measles. And uh, he was taken home. And then after a relatively short period, a few months, Kath took him to the doctors, my wife, um, and he had a, a wheeze. Um, they were, I think, overcautious, but that's the right thing with a child of that age. And they took him into hospital. The first three days of his care were completely unremarkable. And, and he was expected to go home on, on that third day. During the course of that, that day, Beverly Allett brought to the attention of other nurses the fact that this little boy was having difficulty breathing. I walked into a scene I did not expect, and that was Paul in the arms of a nurse, I think, at that particular time. He was cold, clammy, grey. And I recall that uh, Nurse Beverly Allett was there, and she said at the time, this child is hypoglycemic. The doctor had been called, the doctor came and Paul was taken into the treatment room and he disappeared for what seemed to be an eternity before um, we were allowed into the treatment room and I remember Paul sat there playing with his toes. He seemed to have made a total recovery. The following day, which was a Sunday, Beverly Alec went to take the drip down 
And within the space of a few minutes, the boy was once again hyperglycemic. So obviously that was quite frightening. So we went within a very short space of time from a child that's coming home to a child that's now seriously ill and without too much explanation. Three days later, this little boy is expected to go home that day because he's continued to, to recover from his attacks. At about 10 minutes to 12, the boy's father goes up to the hospital canteen to get himself a sandwich, and when he returns some 20 minutes or so later, he finds a little boy that is gray, arched back, and clearly in some form of distress. Paul came from the ward that Paul had collapsed again, and my colleague rushed through, and when he saw his collapse, he immediately called the team from Nottingham and transferred him. He went in the ambulance, both with my wife and, um, and with a doctor and Nurse Beverly Allen went in the ambulance with him. I remember walking into the ward at Queen's Medical Centre and it was just a totally different atmosphere. Calm, relaxed, Paul's in intensive care, but I just got the feeling that he was just going to get better. And he did. Transferring Paul Crampton to Queen's Medical Centre in Nottingham had saved his life. Test revealed the insulin in his blood, which is usually between four and six milli units per litre, was alarmingly high. Dr Porter had taken blood which had been sent to the University Hospital at Cardiff for examination. The insulin in the blood of Paul Crampton at 47,000 is the second highest ever recorded in the world. He was fortunate enough to survive and it was felt that he had abnormal external insulin being administered. I think when we got the blood results, I began to realize that there was a serial killer that, that was working on that ward and, and was uh, causing the collapses of, of these children. I had a phone call from Grantham Police um, and it was, we'd like to come and see you. Uh, I won't tell you what it is, but we'll come and see you tomorrow. So at an office in Grantham at the time, and a um, sergeant walked in, and then he said, um, we have reason to believe that Paul's um, illness, hyperglycemic attack, were a result of maladministration of drugs. And I remember my words exactly. That would explain a lot, wouldn't it? It was unthinkable. Was someone at Grantham and Castephen Hospital murdering helpless children? the police had to investigate each of the cases to try and find the killer. They would begin with seven-week-old Liam Taylor, who was admitted on the 21st of February 1991, just two days after nurse Beverly Allett had begun working on Ward 4. They had to tread carefully. In a healthcare setting, it is very difficult to investigate a murder or, or a suspected murder because all of the, the individuals on that, that ward have a legitimate reason to be there. Um, they have the access to the victim anyway. And often it's very difficult to prove that direct link between one particular member of staff and one particular victim. So the police have got a really, really difficult job on their hands when they're investigating this type of crime and it wasn't going to get any easier. About a week or so into the inquiry, the whole investigation was blown by the local paper. And of course, then the world's press descended on, on Grantham. Local radio reporter Sean Dunderdale was one of the first journalists to latch on to the story. None of us had experienced a story like this um, before. We, we, we kind of heard rumors. We knew the police were involved at the hospital, that something was happening. But exactly what? I mean, at that stage, I don't think even the police knew what they were facing, what they were coping with. Because nobody knew what was happening, there wasn't that much information to start with. And slowly, it started to um, develop as a story that, that clearly something uh, big was happening at Grantham, that there was a major investigation. And eventually, it did uh, sort of get out there into the, into the media. And that there had been certainly a number of, uh, of, of odd occurrences involving children on the children's ward. Detectives began to approach family members of the victims with the shocking news that their children may have been deliberately attacked by an active serial killer. 
In the early stages of the investigation, the, the parents were certainly had a, a, an attitude that suggested that the police should not be interfering with an investigation of, of this type. I think it's fair to say that as the teams began to investigate the circumstances and they became more and more aware of the circumstances surrounding the collapse of their child, they became more and more on board. Police had to try and find a link between all 13 of the children who'd been affected. They began with the first suspicious case, the death of seven-week-old Liam Taylor, who'd been left under the care of a new staff nurse, Beverly Allett. On the 21st of February of 1991, he was taken uh, to Grantham Hospital and was seen by one of the paediatricians and diagnosed with bronchiolitis. A couple of hours later, they see their child with just a nappy on. He's clearly terribly distressed, and the nurse, Beverly Allett, explains that during the course of feeding, he'd vomited and choked. The next evening, the two parents decide to stay in the hospital. The mom is so tired that she goes to bed early and the father stays up. He looks in on the child just before midnight after having had a shower at the hospital and sees that there's a nurse with him. He goes off to bed thinking that the problems are, are over and he's awoken about five o'clock in the morning by the night sister who asks him to come because Liam has relapsed. The child's blue, back's arched and Dr. Nanyakara tells them that he stopped breathing and they'd had some difficulty restarting the heart. Later that morning, Liam dies. Sadly, I had to share with the parents and said, look, this is impossible, but I can't do anything more. I felt so sad, he died in my hands. The last nurse to tend to Liam before his death was Beverly Allett, who joined the ward just four days previously. It was her first ever nursing role. So Beverly Allett had applied to other hospitals, other departments for a job as a nurse upon her completing her, her qualification, and she'd been turned down by all of them. When Ward 4 employed Beverly Allett, it was because they were incredibly short-staffed. They were pretty desperate. They, they needed more nurses on duty. And normally, they wouldn't have taken Beverly Allett on because she, she didn't have the correct level of qualifications, the, the usual level of qualifications that they would ask for. So it was desperation, really. Allett had begun training as a nurse at 16. Even at a young age, she seemed to have an unhealthy fascination with hospitals. She was a regular in the A&E department. She would constantly turn up there complaining of various symptoms and illnesses. And she got a bit of a reputation amongst the, the staff there. So they were very surprised to learn that, that she was a trainee nurse. And the, the dots just simply weren't joined up. Because often when, when somebody is a nurse and they're training as a nurse, you're only seeing them you know, during that part of their day. You're not seeing the, the bigger picture. Detectives investigating the suspicious incidents on Ward 4 had begun to look into each case to find a common link. Beverly Allett had again been on duty on the 5th of March 1991, the day that Timothy Hardwick was admitted. Timothy Hardwick was an 11-year-old boy who had a lot of problems in his life. He, he suffered with cerebral palsy and was epileptic. He had an epileptic fit at school in Newark. As a result, he was transferred to Grantham Hospital, where doctors managed to get his fitting under control. A very, very short time after Beverly had been left with him, this child suddenly stops breathing. She raises the alarm, and the crash team are called. One of the staff nurses came to my office and said, Dr. Nanekar, can you please come and see Timothy? He is not well. Apparently, he had collapsed, and then when I went there, I tried to resuscitate him, but by that time, he virtually had no signs of life. Sadly, they can't resuscitate him, and the child dies. 
Just five days later, on March the 10th, 14-month-old Kaylee Desmond was on Ward 4 suffering with a chest infection. After being left alone with Alit for some one-to-one -one nursing, Kaylee had an unexpected heart attack. Beverly Alec was seen in the room and actually called other nurses to go and have a look, which was one of her common things. She would call other nurses to say, come and have a look at this child, and then the crash team would be called. Kaylee survived the collapse and was transferred to another hospital. Due to the massive toll the arrest put on her young body, she was left brain damaged. Detectives investigating the unusual pattern a patient collapses on Ward 4 found a clue in Kaylee's x-rays. We were able to show that there was needle tracking under the arm of this little girl and, and, and an air bubble, which had obviously um, caused the equivalent of what we would call a heart attack. This mysterious needle mark was further proof to detectives they were dealing with a killer. They'd already discovered the high insulin count in the blood of Paul Crampton, who survived. They continued their investigations with the cases of two more suspiciously ill children, Bradley Gibson and two-year-old Yik Chan. Bradley Gibson is admitted under Dr. Porter. He was about five or six-year-old and had breathing difficulties. Dr. Porter had treated him with possible chest infection and he then suddenly had stopped breathing and stopped his heartbeat as well, what we call a cardiac arrest, which is extremely rare. Dr. Porter had tried repeatedly to resuscitate him with the defibrillator. He managed to get him round, extremely fortunate. Yik Chan was admitted with a suspected fractured skull. He's in the hospital for a couple of days and he's charging around the place. There's clearly not very much wrong with him. One particular evening, um, Beverly Allett is going off duty and she speaks to the oncoming nurse at about nine o'clock in the evening and said, can you have a look in at, at Chan? He's crying, he's, he's not very well. The oncoming nurse goes into the room and, and finds him with his back arched and blue and the crash team are called and he's resuscitated. Bradley Gibson and Yik Chan both survived unscathed. Three-month-old identical twins, Katie and Becky Phillips, were not so lucky. The pair were born prematurely and were regular visitors to Ward 4. In early April 1991, they were back and being treated by Dr. Nana Yukana. They had repeated admissions, not surprisingly again, with a variety of illnesses, diarrhea, vomiting, breathing difficulties, and so on and so forth. And the parents, quite rightly, were very worried and brought them straight to the hospital rather than going to the GP. I had seen them and discharged them, reassured the parents, but the same night, Becky was brought to the casualty. The casualty staff taking lots of effort to resuscitate her, but she was virtually dead. So I had a long discussion with the parents. They were completely shocked and they were very, very upset. I left some blood samples in the laboratory for any future investigations if needed. And we subsequently found uh, that that blood and had it analysed, and that contained 9,660 milliunits per litre of, of insulin in the blood. And you always have to remember with these huge figures that a child should have 15 to 20 milliunits. So it, it's horrendous. Later on that same day, April the 5th, Dr Nana Yakara asked Becky's parents to bring her twin sister Katie in as a precaution. Katie's taken into hospital and that afternoon she is allocated to the care of Beverly Allett. One of the senior nurses goes to that particular room to see what's going on. As she enters, she sees Beverly Allett nursing the child in her arms. The child's crying. She sees that the child collapse within Beverly Allett's arms and the crash team are, are called. They manage to resuscitate Katie, who is, is later transferred. But over the next three days, the child Katie suffers convulsions, and this child 
is severely brain damaged as a result of, of what occurred. Now, during my investigation, Detective Inspector Jones managed to find x-rays that were taken at the time. The child had squeeze injuries, which had broken a number of ribs. This was further evidence that proved to detectives that something very sinister was happening on Ward 4 at Grantham and Castephen Hospital. Between the deaths of Becky Phillips on the 5th of April and Claire Peck on April the 22nd, four more boys had been admitted with minor symptoms and unexpectedly came close to death. That made a total of 13 suspicious incidents, four deaths and nine close calls. But now investigators had the arduous task of making a list of suspects. One of the names on that list was a woman who always seemed to be on duty whenever something went wrong. 22-year-old staff nurse, Beverly Allen. In May 1991, police were investigating a spate of mysterious deaths and illnesses on the children's ward at Grantham and Castephen Hospital in Lincolnshire. After digging deeper into the individual cases, they were certain they were chasing a serial killer. There's clear evidence of air injected under the arm of one child. There's evidence of squeeze injuries. There's evidence of um, insulin. What was a common factor with the vast majority of these children was that each of them had a cannula fitted, a, a sight, um, usually in the back of the hand, where drugs or drips can be administered through. So injecting cardiotoxic drugs would not be, would not be very difficult because it could go in through the IV port. This is quite a common method for, firstly, a female serial killer and a healthcare serial killer. Poison is a very common method used by these people. It's accessible. It's something that, that is not going to immediately cause concern because this is something that's already in that hospital environment anyway. And also, poisoning is quite a, quite a remote method of killing somebody. You're not up close and personal with them. It's not messy. You can administer the poison and then, then leave the scene. You don't have to see them uh, suffer the effects of it. Chief Superintendent Stuart Clifton and his team interviewed all the staff members on Ward 4, and a new piece of evidence emerged that suddenly became crucial. I began to look at the circumstances of insulin in Grantham Hospital, and I found that it was kept in locked fridges on, on the wards. And on the children's ward, the key to the fridge had gone missing three days before the first child had collapsed. Beverly Allett was the last known person to have that key, but no hospital investigation had actually taken place. Beverly Allett's name kept cropping up she always seemed to be at the hospital when the incidents occurred, and the staff duty rotor confirmed this. What we discovered was that for every collapse, Beverly Allett was the only nurse that was on duty on every occasion. And on many of these occasions, we could actually put her right at the bedside, either at the time of the collapse or just before. On the 21st of May, 1991, Stuart Clifton made the brave decision of having Beverly Allett arrested. I basically couldn't take the chance that if she was still working on there, she would harm more children. Albeit that I hadn't completed the investigation by any means. We, we were merely scraping the surface at that time. So she was arrested and the house was searched. During the course of that search, we found a hospital pillowcase, a used syringe, and a little child's notebook, and it was headed allocations book. This allocations book had gone missing from Ward 4. It detailed the names of children who needed extra attention and which nurse was allocated to them. It was not only further proof that Alice had been caring for the children who died, but evidence that she was hiding the information from her colleagues. Beverly Allett was interviewed at the police station over the course of two days. She made no admissions. In fact, she went so far as to 
distance herself from all the events at that hospital, saying things such as, I wasn't there on that day, My, I didn't come on duty until after that had happened. So she, she completely distanced herself, maintained her innocence. She was a very strange girl in the interview, in that she would talk to you quite quite normally, or talk to the, the interviewing officers quite normally about things like football, pop music. And the minute you got down to, to actually talking about the events at Grantham Hospital, she became a completely different person. When news of the arrest broke, the press knew this was a huge story. Once the investigation went that one step further and obviously a nurse had been arrested, a nurse was clearly under investigation, they had to go public with that and that's when it all exploded really. That's when the world's media were, were suddenly interested because it had never been heard of before that a nurse would do such a thing. You know, it's such a rarity and certainly in this country at first. The, the whole of, of Grantham was just surrounded by journalists, uh, TV crews from around the world, newspapers. Alit's arrest was also a huge shock for the victims' families. I felt mixed emotions. One is he would want to harm a child, but secondly, we now know what was wrong with Paul, and thank God it's not anything to do with Paul. It's not a medical problem. It is an outside influence. Stuart Clifton and his team were convinced that Alit was behind the deaths, but they had no proof. She was released on bail without charge. I convinced the hospital that they needed to suspend Beverly Allett from duty because we couldn't take the chance, and they couldn't take the chance, that another child would be attacked. The police needed to build a case. If they were right about Allett, then they just released a serial killer into the public. Chief Superintendent Stuart Clifton turned back to the expert who just a month previously had concluded the majority of the cases could be explained medically. I, I asked uh, David Hull, to go away and relook at the case notes of the children, but to use the statements that my team had taken, which detailed the circumstances of the collapse of each of, each of these children. He, he agreed to do that. Months passed as Stuart Clifton and his team built the case against Beverly Allett. And by November 1991, Professor Harland re-examined his original case notes. Based on the new evidence found by detectives, he agreed that all the incidents could be viewed as suspicious. On the 20th of November, Alec was arrested once more. The former nurse is charged with the murder of four children. She also faces eight charges of attempted murder of eight other children. She faces a further eight charges of causing grievous bodily harm with intent. She was due to appear at the Grantham Magistrates Court the next day. Bear in mind, this is a young girl that's never been in police custody before. And at nine o'clock the next morning, one of the policewomen had to go and wake her up. She didn't appear to have a, a care in the world. There wasn't very much in the way of remorse. Um, she didn't cry. There was no kind of real visible reaction in her. So I think she does have that kind of cold personality. Um, she's, she's orchestrated all of these terrible events, but, but she doesn't feel any impact from them. She's somebody who, who doesn't have the same feelings and emotions as, as the rest of us. During the 15-month wait for her trial, the stunned press began to uncover Beverly Allett's history of faking illnesses and self-harming. The more we dug into Allett's background, again, the more unbelievable it became. And, and the one question our listeners would ask is, how? How did nobody spot all of this um, and, and allow her to continue being a nurse? How did she get through that recruitment process? We got her authorization to, from her to have a look at her medical records. They indicated, going back to childhood, that, that Beverly liked to be the center of attention. There were incidents while she was at school where she would sprain a finger and demand that she, her arm be put in a sling. I think we, it's tempting to look back and say they should have picked up on that, they should have known that, that this was somebody who was not quite right. But I don't think they would have automatically made the link between somebody um, who was perhaps harming themselves and somebody who would then go on to harm other people. Nurses care for their patients, they want to preserve their lives and enhance their, their quality of life. So to think that a nurse would do this is it's almost unthinkable. 
On February the 15th, 1993, 24-year-old Beverly Allard was in Nottingham Crown Court, charged with the murder of four children and the attempted murder of a further nine. Her not guilty plea meant a trial would have to take place. For much of the time, Beverly was not there because she was suffering from anorexia and was supposedly too ill to attend trial. The judge, in his wisdom, ruled that it should go ahead without her. The court case was a very harrowing uh, experience. I mean, it was, it was a long, drawn-out affair. Uh, Beverly Alec wasn't in court for a lot of it. Again, I think some of that manipulation that she was, was known for, some of the manipulation she'd clearly done in the hospital, she was trying it with the, the court case as well, and I know that was having an impact on, on family members. They knew of their own individual case, but the actual scale of it, apart from what they'd read in the media, heard on the radio, it was the first time they'd actually heard exactly what had been happening at Grantham Hospital. I mean, that was quite traumatic because obviously there was, a there was significant media interest and, and we couldn't walk down the street from the car park to the court case without having microphones and stuffed under our nose and, and cameras flashing. And, you know, there was a lot of emotion, a lot of emotion around that time, clearly. You couldn't just go home and, you know, close the door and put the TV on and forget about it. It was, it, it just was all encompassing. It was, it was the only thing that was on my mind throughout the case and, and for a long time afterwards as well. In the times that Alit was in the courtroom, she seemed completely distanced from what was going on around her. I firmly believe she felt the families would still be on her side because, you know, they'd been very close. You know, they thought, certainly initially, in those initial stages, that, um, you know, she'd helped save or tried to save their child's life. And so in court, you know, she would smile at them. To the outside world, a lot of the evidence may have seemed circumstantial, but as the trial went on, it became clear the case against Alit was a strong one. For a long time, people believed it must be a mistake. You know, a nurse surely wouldn't be, be, be responsible for that. There must be some other explanation for it. But then slowly, as the evidence re was revealed, uh, you could see that tide turning, that, that, that people suddenly realised complete revulsion, that, that a nurse, of all people, would, would, would do that. Um, you know, it's suddenly like, well, if I can't trust a nurse, who can I trust? Um, and, and I think that, that was a, a real shock to the nation. It resonated right across the country um, when those, those actual facts came out about what Beverly Alley had done. During the trial, the jury heard from experts who believed that Alice had been suffering with a mental illness throughout her life, which caused her to commit the murders. Well, Munchausen syndrome is a, a condition which basically means that people will invent symptoms in themselves in order to gain the, the attention of medical professionals. There's also Munchausen syndrome by proxy. This is when somebody invents symptoms in somebody else in order to get attention from medical professionals. And, and that somebody else is often uh, a, a child or, or somebody who, who you're in charge of the care of. I think she's, she's certainly ill and there has to be an element of, of evil somewhere within that because people can be ill without, without wishing to cause harm to other people. On the 28th of May 1993, after a draining three-month trial, the jury had reached a decision. I think the moment we were called back into the court is, is something, you know, we'll always, or certainly I'll always remember. It was very tense, you know, very quiet. The member of the jury stood up and that first verdict came in of guilty. And there was just, a, again, an intake of breath, lasted just a couple of seconds. Then someone, I remember, shouted yes. And I think there was a couple of um, uh, people clapping uh, and then tears from the families, tears from members of the public. It was a very difficult job for the police to actually say, you know, without doubt, Beverly Alec was responsible. So, so there was always that possibility if the jury could have just tipped the other way. And thankfully, you know, that guilty verdict came in. I think it was a huge sense of relief for everyone. On May the 28th, 1993, Judge Mr Justice Latham sentenced Beverly Allett to 13 concurrent life sentences, one for each of the charges against her. A relieved David Crampton made a statement outside the courtroom. 
Well, I saw Beverly out as a rather pathetic figure, really, and when we listened to her medical evidence, we probably could conclude that these tragedies were inevitable. There was clearly some massive media interest associated with the Alec case, both pre and post the trial. That was pretty easy for me and my family because um, Paul was at home and well. If Paul, had, if something worse had happened to Paul, um, such as it happened to other families, how would I have conducted myself? I don't know. Thankfully, I'll never have to know. Paul is 26 years old, he has a house, he has a long-term partner, lovely girl, he's got a career. Paul's doing very well, very, very well. Beverly Allard was immediately sent to Holloway Prison, but after just a week behind bars, she was transferred to Rampton Secure Hospital in Nottinghamshire. I think the fact that Beverly Allett has ended up in a secure hospital is, is a really interesting one for me because this is somebody who, before developing Munchausen syndrome by proxy, could have been argued to, to have just Munchausen syndrome. So she was fabricating illnesses and symptoms in herself before she was harming other people. She was going after that role as the patient. She wanted to be seen, you know, by medical professionals and, and, and play that sick role. She's essentially achieved what she set out to achieve. She's got that status as the patient, which she always wanted. What do I think about where Alex serving her sentence? I, I, I don't waste any energy on that. I don't, don't really think about it. She doesn't enjoy the same freedoms that I do, my rest of my family and the vast majority of the population of this country. She's in a prison. Um, whether that is more comfortable than perhaps some people would like is a bit academic, really. In December 1993, Central Television interviewed Beverly Allard inside Rampton Hospital as part of a special news report. She enjoys relative luxury and freedom within the maximum security walls. The parents of her victims who gave their approval for these pictures to be included in Central TV's The Tuesday Special tonight believe she should be in prison. It's not too bad. What's the good thing about it? We're out. Oh, more freedom in it. You like it better than where you were before? Yes. Why? Because I've got more freedom. I'm not locked up all the time. Stuart Clifton also visited Allett inside Rampton in 1994, determined to get the truth out of her. She made admissions at that time. She admitted nine of the 13 cases that she'd been um, convicted of. She wouldn't have anything to do with the two Phillips cases. The minute that I began to press her for details about precisely what she'd done, what she'd used, she just walked away from me, wouldn't answer any more questions. There are plenty of questions left unanswered, especially for the loved ones of the victims of Beverly Allett. Allett's crimes are like dropping a pebble into a pool of water. Those ripples spread far and wide. A dramatic effect clearly on the families, how the families of the victims, but their extended family, grandparents, parents, etc., and of course a dramatic effect on the hospital and its staff. So her crimes went far and wide into the community, not just the immediate people affected. I think Beverly Allett was, was really most at home when she was in the middle of a drama. So she was deliberately creating the drama and then casting herself in a, in a leading role within it. There's a real impact there of, of you know, it, it could have been a family member. You know, um, it's the local hospital. One of my members of my younger family could have gone into the hospital to be cared for by a nurse, and look what happened. And that could, and that's the thing with this story. You know, it could have happened to absolutely anyone. The parents who were affected by that were purely unlucky that their child went into that hospital on that day, and that Beverly Allen was their nurse. We may never understand why Beverly Allard intentionally set out to poison the children she was meant to care for. Her lust for attention turned from selfish to deadly. And for three months in 1991, she acted upon it in the most horrific manner. Nobody on Ward 4 was safe. But the determination of doctors and police brought justice for all the victims' families and proved that Beverly Allett, the angel of death, was a cold-blooded killer. On November the 11th, 1988, police searching for missing 51-year-old Bert Montoya 
paid a visit to the boarding house where he'd been living in Sacramento, California. Rumors of suspicious activity in the garden led detectives to begin digging up the area. I'm sitting in this hole and I'm hanging on to what looks like a, a human femur bone. Over the next three days, seven bodies would be discovered under the ground at 1426 F Street. The landlady and number one suspect was a 59-year-old woman named Dorothea Puente. When you look at this person, you don't automatically assume or even think that this is a serial killer. She looks like everybody's grandma. Puente had been stealing from the tenants who trusted her. The easiest way to keep them quiet was to murder them. She was a survivalist. Killing these people were necessary to survive, period. They had to go. Dorothea Puente had been unmasked as one of the world's most evil killers. It is one of the most infamous homes in the USA. 1426 F Street in downtown Sacramento, California, became the makeshift burial site of seven people. Their landlady and murderer was 59-year-old Dorothea Puente. Eventually charged with nine murders in 1988, she had poisoned her tenants in order to steal from them. Puente died in 2011 at the age of 82, but the house lives on. Now under the ownership of Tom Williams and Barbara Holmes, it's become a macabre monument to her. It was built in 1895, and it's gone through a lot of iterations. A lot of people have been in and out of it. Uh, it can't be torn down. It's considered a historic uh, house in the Sacramento, and they would not let anybody tear it down. So it's here it sits. Detective John Cabrera helped bring Puente to justice when he uncovered human remains in the yard of 1426 F Street in November 1988. As far as the interior of this house, it's still the same. The floors in which the victims walked on, the floor in the sleeping bedroom, is where the victims lied. It's still the original floors in here, everything. The Victorian house has become a tourist attraction and Tom and Barbara have embraced the gruesome history of it. We love it. Uh, we, we have no problem whatsoever with uh, any of it. So it's just our house and we made it home and we're, we're, we're pretty happy with it. Now, you still get people walking by asking, you know, how could we be crazy enough to buy this house and stuff. But between the two of us, we've made it into a home. Yeah, right? and, and you know, we tried to um, make it more comfortable and, and try to diffuse the whole mystique around it. And yeah, we, we were doing our best. She was a hardened criminal in the body of a little old lady. Yeah, she was a hard, hard person. Pure evil. Despite the renovations, John still remembers the home as the boarding house where nine people lost their lives. This is what I would call the death room. This is where Dorothea would bring her victims after giving them the drug and alcohol combination and then bringing them in here and leaving them on the floor until she could prepare them at a later time. And when I pull the carpet back, the odor was so overwhelming, it was unbelievable. But I knew and recognized that smell. And it was the smell of putrefied body fluid that had seeped through the wooden floor from her victims who had laid there for anywhere from two to four weeks, probably. The day after finding the first body, Saturday, November the 12th, 1988, John vividly recalls the moment he realized the little old lady living at 1426 F Street was not what she seemed. I looked up at one point onto that balcony and Dorothea was standing there looking right straight down at me, knowing that probably within minutes, I was gonna uncover that second body. 
and sidetracked me from digging in order to walk her over to the motel. And it's there she made her escape. Puente would remain a wanted fugitive for five days, but her story begins over 85 years ago. She was born Dorothea Gray in San Bernardino County, California, on January the 9th, 1929. She was one of several children. She lost both of her parents quite early on. She spent time in an orphanage. She was kind of passed from pillar to post quite a lot. So she didn't form those stable, secure attachments with her caregivers that many of us do. And I think that went on to shape the person that she became. Dorothea, you know, lived a very difficult early childhood. She was deprived in substantial ways. She didn't have loving parents. She had to scavenge for food. By the mid-1960s, Dorothea had been married three times and taken on the name of her third husband, Puente. She had already served time in prison for forging checks and had found a new way to earn money. She starts to, to get involved in sex work, selling her body um, to, to basically put clothes on her back and feed herself. So she is living this, this quite kind of feral existence. Now, here's an individual for whom violence and abuse was just normal for her. If we look back at her childhood experiences, they're certainly not normal and warm and, and loving. They are quite brutal and quite cold. So this is the only thing that, that she knows. It's, it's those basic emotions and those basic instincts. And then, after becoming a prostitute, she discovered this occupation of being a caregiver, which requires minimal qualifications. And all of a sudden, a world was opened up to her. In 1981, Puente began renting an apartment at 1426 F Street in downtown Sacramento. She took on the role of caretaker for the other tenants in the Victorian boarding house. Soon after, Puente met 61-year-old Ruth Munro. Ruth's son, Bill Clausen, remembers his mother fondly. She was great. I mean, she was my mom. I'm going to say she's great. Uh, but she was. She, she brought up five kids after my father passed away, and I thought she did a good job. We met Dorothea through a gentleman that my mom met while she was working, and he kept asking her out, and he f she finally went out with him, and then they started seeing each other, and he introduced her to Dorothea. During their friendship, Dorothea decided she wanted to open a restaurant, and my mom wasn't working anymore, and uh, my mom had a little bit of money, so she ended up opening the little cafe at the Round Corner Bar. Ruth ended up marrying Harold, the man who'd introduced her to Puente. But soon he was diagnosed with cancer and living full time in a hospital. Ruth didn't want to live alone and Puente had an idea. She could live with her at 1426 F Street. It turned out to be a fatal decision. We moved her in there on Easter Sunday, 1982, and she died April, April 26th, two weeks later. Um, I saw my mom every day from the time I moved her in there. I stopped by there on my way home from work. And the last three days of her life, um, she seemed like she was getting sick. And when I went there, I had noticed that she had a drink in her hand and my mom didn't drink. So I asked her, I said, what's that? And she said, it was a drink that Dorothea fixed to, to calm her nerves. But I said, fine, and I didn't think anything of it because I knew they were friends and okay, fine. But Ruth deteriorated so badly over the next few days that the next time Bill went to visit her, she was almost catatonic. Mom was laying there. I sat next to her and touched her and told her, I said, Dorothea's taking care of you, you'll be fine. And uh, she had a tear coming out of her eye and that was it. She didn't say anything. She just laid there. 
the next morning, I got a call from my brother telling me that mom was, mom was dead. Went over there. She had already been taken away by the coroner's wagon and Dorothea had said that she committed suicide. The news stunned Bill. Totally out of character. She had, she had everything to live for. She had grandchildren, she was happy. What's well, not easy, not easy. You still have the pain in your heart. By August 1982, Dorothea was back in trouble with the authorities. She had been abusing her position as caretaker for her fellow tenants. Dorothea had pled guilty to fraud. She was uh, forging signature on the back of Social Security checks of her victims and then cashing them. She uh, received a prison sentence and was sent to the women's prison down in Chowchilla. Well, in 1985, she was paroled. And when she paroled, she came back to Sacramento and she came back to 1426 F Street. The caretaker was back in business. The next time police arrived on Dorothea Puente's doorstep, they would be armed with shovels searching for a missing man. And what they would unearth in the yard of 1426 F Street would shock the world. In September 1985, 56-year-old Dorothea Puente was out of prison after serving three years for fraud and back living at 1426 F Street, the boarding house where she acted as landlady for her ne'er-do-well tenants. Despite being on parole, Puente continued to exploit the other residents by collecting their social security checks and keeping most of the money for herself. She knows that vulnerable people aren't really looked after, that, that people are forgotten about, that, that, that people don't care about them. And, and she goes and she targets them. So she's a predator who's, who's not just picking up on individual vulnerabilities, but she's picking up on social ones as well. For three years, Puente went undetected. Tenants at the Sacramento boarding house came and went until November 1988, when a local social worker Judy Moise filed a missing persons report after losing touch with a 51-year-old called Bert Montoya. Bert suffered from mental disabilities and was a diagnosed schizophrenic. His last known address was 1426 F Street. I got a copy of the report. And um, what I started doing then was running a background check on the missing person who was Bert Montoya, and trying to get a little bit of background on him, and also running a check on the caretaker who was in charge of this particular individual. And Bert was a disabled adult, and uh, the caretaker, Dorothea Puente, was apparently in charge of him living here. On November the 11th, 1988, John Cabrera, his partner Terry Brown, and Puente's parole officer, Jim Wilson, decided to pay a visit to 1426 F Street to search for some clues into the disappearance of Bert Montoya. Prior to leaving on that day, uh, we were starting to leave, and Judy Moiz um, turned to me and said, you guys better take some shovels. And I went, well, what for? And she said, because I've driven by in the past and I've seen mounds of dirt out there and uh, it kind of looked like a burial ground. Armed with shovels, John, Terry, and Jim arrived at Puente's boarding house. Well, we come to the front door, knock on the door, the three of us, and uh, she answered. And she's dressed very nicely. She looked at me and said, I was expecting you guys. You know, it kind of caught me off guard. And I said, okay, well, I said, you know why we're here? We're here to see, you know, uh, about Bert, what happened to him? And she said, yeah, and uh, I asked if we could come in. John's first task was to find out more about the mysterious house. What is this place, 1426 F Street? What is it here that you're running? What is this place? What are you doing here? And at that time, she looked at me, she looked at her parole officer, and she just said, you know, um, Jim, uh, I'm in violation of my parole. 
Puente had been ordered not to run a boarding house after her release from prison in 1985. She'd got away with it for three years due to her seemingly charming persona. Dorothea Puente played this role. She crafted this incredibly skilled performance as a harmless little old lady. So she would often take her teeth out. She would tell people she was 10 or 15 years older than she actually was. She wanted to present herself as, as innocent and kindly when she was anything but. While Jim and Terry chatted with Puente in the kitchen, John began his search of 1426 F Street. It appeared that Bert Montoya had simply vanished into thin air. After I completely looked through the rooms, didn't find anything, I came back. And bearing in mind what Judy had talked about as far as the mounds of dirt, I asked Dorothea, I said, look, um, I'm going to be able to tell the social worker that we looked and we didn't find anything. And she was somewhat agreeable with that. OK, you know, that's good. And um, then I said, I have one more question for you. Can I dig in your yard? And she says, why don't we do this? You guys go back to the office. I know you have a lot better work to do than to be over here. And then I'll make a phone call. I'll call some people. They'll come over here, and they'll do the digging for you, and then you can come back. I thanked her, and uh, I said, you know, we're here. We have the shovels. We'll just go ahead and dig around. If there's anything we put out of place, we'll do our best to get it back, you know, to the way it was. And so she says, OK. And that's when we went outside to dig around. The three men only had two shovels, so John borrowed one from Puente. So we had three shovels, three of us were digging, and in one of the holes is what we started finding, something similar to cloth. And it just seemed out of place in the ground. And then I dig a little bit further, and I was down to about three feet. And that's when I thought I struck a tree root. So I took the shovel and I started banging on it and I started trying to dislodge this root or sever it so I could continue to dig down. And I couldn't do it. It just wouldn't break. So I got down in the hole and with both of my hands and bracing my feet, I just kept pulling on this, what I thought to be a root. And I pulled on it and pulled on it and finally it dislodged itself. And I'm sitting in this hole and I'm hanging on to what looks like a human femur bone. And at that time, get out of the hole, and I realized something's up. We've just come across human remains. The three men were completely stunned, as was Puente. She looked down into the hole, and she could see the bone. And she grabs your mouth, and she's, oh, is that what I think it is? And, yeah. What can you tell me about this? She says, I don't know, but there's been other people that's been living here. I was in prison, and there was a lot more people living here before her. John halted the dig. A full forensic search of the yard would have to begin the next day. At that time, I decided I was going to take Dorothea back down to the Hall of Justice, and I was going to now question her in full. I questioned her about what I found. I questioned her about where Bert was. I'd even told her as part of my technique in my interview, I said, I bet if I dig any more, I'm going to find more bodies. And she just looked right at me and said, well, if you do, I didn't put them there. As news spread of the discovery of human remains, the press were in attendance at 1426 F Street the very next day. Saturday, November the 12th, 1988. Deputy Coroner Laura Santos was in charge of the excavation. I think there's a mode you go into when you're an investigator that you just know you have a job to focus on, and you just focus on that. And there were a lot of distractions because there were reporters from all over the world, and there were crowds of people lining the streets and people would shout at me and, and tell me things like, turn towards the camera when you're digging. And, um, you know, I just had to ignore it and shut it all out because I just felt I had a job to do. And I knew it was a really important job and that 
a lot of what happened in the future was going to hinge on what I did as far as whether she was prosecuted or not. Despite having a body unearthed in her yard, 59-year-old Dorothea Puente had not been charged with any offence. There was no reason to suspect she may be responsible. As John Cabrera continued his dig, Puente called him into the house. And she says, am I under arrest? And I just thought, how odd. What, what was it that gave her the impression that she was under arrest? Immediately, I said, no. And I said, why do you ask? And she said, well, all of this is making me nervous. And she goes, I would like to get a cup of coffee. And I'd like to go over to where my nephew is, around the corner at the hotel. And I said, OK, get what you need, and then I'll walk you over there. She comes walking out, has a little red coat, has her purse, walk down the stairs, walk out. But what I had told her was that I would escort her because there were a lot of people starting to gather. And I thought, I don't want anyone walking up to her or bothering her. So I used that ruse to uh, walk her down to the corner. A photographer captured the moment John escorted Puente out of the house. No one yet knew it, but Dorothea Puente would never return to 1426 F Street. And I watched her go all the way down and then go up into the hotel. And that was the last I saw of her at that time. So I run back and I continue digging again. Short time later, I hit something and I'm fiddling around with my shovel. I'm trying to get it up, figuring what's down here. And I keep trying to bring it up and bring it up. And I do. And in my shovel is a human leg. So immediately, I stop. I yell to my commander, we have another one. And he runs over, and the first thing he asks is, where's Dorothea? It was a good question. Where was Dorothea Puente? A second body had been found buried in her yard, and she was nowhere to be seen. She wasn't at the hotel having a coffee. It had all been a ruse so that she could make an escape. Dorothea Puente was on the run. On Saturday, November the 12th, 1988, a police forensic team were digging up the yard of a boarding house in Sacramento, California. They had just unearthed a second body. Dorothea Puente, the 59-year-old landlady of 1426 F Street, had left the house and headed to a nearby hotel to have a coffee. But detectives were now very keen to speak with her. I said I took her and watched her go to the coffee shop. She's supposedly over there at the hotel. So then another detective came and found out by speaking with um, the person at the counter in there that, in fact, Dorothea had come into the hotel, walked through the lobby, went to a payphone, picked up a payphone, and called, apparently called a taxi cab because the cab arrived and took off. Puente had absconded, and detectives had no idea where she was headed. And so at that time, we called in the FBI and um, you know, enlisted the help of other uh, resources and outside agencies in trying to locate her, because that is what was key right now, is to try to find her as fast as we could. Back at 1426 F Street, one of the many people who had gathered to watch the dig had given some important information to Deputy Coroner Laura Santos. He told the story that um, he had dug holes in this yard for Dorothy, and she paid him cash. And then she, and he, she just told him she was burying trash. So he came in and pointed out where he had dug holes. Over the next three days, the excavation of the yard continued. Just as we kept digging, we kept finding bodies and more bodies and it just seemed endless. Whatever we took down, whatever we moved, wherever we were digging, we'd find a body. It was just unbelievable. She put seven people in this small yard, and there wasn't even a witness to any of these burials, not one. 
The seventh and final body was found on Monday the 14th of November. It was buried right in front of the house, just feet from the sidewalk. Well, she was kind of bundled up in almost like a, a scrunched up seated position, but she was missing her head, hands and feet. I went through every flower pot and emptied them out to make sure that we weren't missing anything, but those appendages were never found. To this day, we've never recovered the head, hands, or feet. Their whereabouts, it's anybody's guess. If the walls in this home could talk, we would probably be horrified. Three days after the discovery of the seventh body, Thursday the 17th of November, Dorothea Puente was finally found. She had been spotted by a man in a bar almost 400 miles from Sacramento in Los Angeles. He goes home, and while he's watching TV, he sees her on TV as being wanted on the news. So he calls LAPD, gives the information, I was just having drinks with this person. The man told the police which hotel Puente was staying in, and she was promptly arrested. John Cabrera immediately flew down to John Wayne Airport in nearby Santa Ana. We landed, LAPD pulled up out on the tarmac. We got out of the plane, and uh, there she was. They had her in cuffs. You know, we ceremoniously uh, walked over, and uh, they transferred a her to me. I asked her, you know, are you okay? Yeah, I'm okay. And then out of nowhere, she just says, Mr. Cabrera, I I'm sorry. John had many questions to ask about the seven bodies buried in Puente's yard, but there was still no proof that they had been murdered. And the 59 year old fugitive wasn't planning on a confession. We got back here to Sacramento. I took her down to the Hall of Justice. Um, at that time, I asked her if she wanted to give any kind of a statement, and uh, she declined, and so we just booked her into Sacramento County Jail. And that would be the last time that I'd ever speak with her. She would never speak to me again. With Puente safely locked away, the task of identifying the seven bodies had begun. Most of them didn't have teeth, or they had one or two teeth. In the case of the one body in the front yard, she didn't have any hands, so we couldn't do fingerprints. So we started gathering information. Most of the tenants at 1426 F Street were either homeless or estranged from their families, which made identifying them even more difficult. In the beginning, there were people saying, oh, you're never going to be able to do this. And so I was pretty happy that I was able to identify everybody. And they all had some kind of disposition, you know, as far as most of them had some family members somewhere. And so they were all buried. Among the seven names was Bert Montoya, the man whose disappearance had initiated the dig on F Street. Bert would be the third body that I found. He was buried under a concrete basin in the backyard. He was number three. And uh, that puzzle was now solved. Bert Montoya had wandered away. He had some type of mental deficiency, and his parents had always taken care of him. In 13, about 13 years before he died, he disappeared from their home in New Orleans, Louisiana, and they had no idea what had happened to him. And it turned out that his 92-year-old mother was still alive and she had been searching for him her whole life, and, or you know, ever since he'd been missing. And so they were really, really grateful to know, even though it was such a sad ending, they were very thankful that they were able to have him come home. As well as identifying the victims, Laura needed to find out the cause of their deaths. Toxicology reports showed that each of the seven bodies had traces of the same prescription sleeping pill. We did find traces of Delmain, the drug in the bodies, and that was another thing that I was able to determine by gathering all these medical records on everyone. None of the victims had ever been prescribed Delmain. Only Dorothea Puente had been described Delmain. This particular drug 
when coupled with alcohol, could be deadly. It just simply puts you in a catatonic state and with the alcohol, overwhelm the body and stop the heart. Poisoning is one of the ways we've seen female serial killers operate because it's a way that doesn't require a lot of physical strength. And so you don't have to overcome your victim physically because that's more difficult for a female, particularly in this case, an elderly female, to overcome the victim physically. As detectives delved into Puente's past, they found even more evidence that exposed her as a callous killer. All in all, in the very end of the investigation, she would be charged with nine murders, seven in the yard in which we would uncover. And then they added Ruth Monroe, Ruth's death had initially been ruled as suicide back in April 1982. The new revelation was a shock for her son, Bill Clausen. Well, that kind of just pulled my stomach. And that's, like I said, that's when it, it brought everything back to where, okay, now we can go after her. You know, because all this time, we know that mom didn't commit suicide, especially with the amounts of the drugs that were in her, all the undissolved pills in her stomach. There's no way that she could have taken all of that and lived long enough to take everything. The ninth victim was a 77-year-old man from Oregon called Everson Gilmouth. He had become pen pals with Puente during her three years in prison for fraud. And then when she paroled in 1985, he went and picked her up and drove her back here to the boarding house. And this is where he would be staying. Within months, Everson had seemingly disappeared and severed all ties with his family. Every time they would call, he was always out. They never got to speak with him, and she always had a reason why. But um, in actuality, he picked her up in late 1985. He was laying in a homemade coffin along the Sacramento River in early 1986. And Everson would, would remain a John Doe until this case in 1988 broke. And that's when his family contacted our office and saying, we're looking for a father. Puente remained on remand for over four years. Her defense lawyers were worried she wouldn't get a fair trial in Sacramento due to her notoriety. Eventually, it was agreed that the trial would be held in Salinas in nearby Monterey County. We got a court date, and what I wanted to do was get in there, give my information, give my testimony, and for the sake of the families of these victims, wanted to make sure that she would never walk on the public streets again, that she wasn't going to do that or harm anybody anymore. But the trial would not be as straightforward as investigators hoped. Puente's refusal to admit to the murders meant they would somehow need to prove that the sweet little old lady in the dock was, in fact, a heartless killer. After being on remand for over four years, the trial of Dorothea Puente finally began at the Monterey County Courthouse on February the 9th, 1993. The 64-year-old admitted to burying the bodies of seven of her tenants and continuing to claim their social security money, but maintained she was innocent of the nine counts of murder against her. Bill Clausen testified during the trial. His 61-year-old mother, Ruth Monroe, was one of the women that Puente was accused of killing in 1982. When I walked to the uh, jury box, or to where I needed to be. She just had a, just a cold stare. Just a cold stare. And after I testified, I walked away. She just kept staring straight ahead up by the judge. It angered me at the time. When I walked back facing her, as I was walking back to go back and sit down, my thoughts were just to, to to strangle her, but I have more control than a lot of people, and I just walked past and went back and sat down and listened to the rest. During the five-month trial, the jury heard from both sides. 
Puente's defence team admitted that she was a thief, but not a murderer, while the prosecution argued that the traces of Dalmain proved that all the victims had been poisoned. On August the 26th, 1993, after deliberating for 24 days, the jury found Dorothea Puente guilty of three murders, but were deadlocked on all the other charges. I think what disappointed me as an investigator, and I think it disappointed uh, people that were involved in the case, that of all the nine charges of murder, seven of them were so similar, there was no doubt that the seven bodies that we found in this yard should have all been guilty. However, only three of the seven in the yard would be charged against her. Four others would go 11 to 1, with one juror saying, no, he didn't believe that's what happened. The juror's refusal to deliberate meant that the judge, Michael Verger, had no choice but to declare a mistrial on the other six charges, one of them being the murder of Ruth Munro. They were talking about doing a retrial because of that, but then they decided not to because of the cost, which, I mean, I understand. It took a lot of money as it was. And then the district attorney kept telling me, well, she's not going to get any more time. She's already going to spend life in prison. So we just kind of, OK, we had to accept it. On December the 10th, 1993, Dorothea Puente was sentenced to life imprisonment without parole. She was immediately sent to the Central California Women's Facility in Chowchilla. The 64-year-old landlady had killed her tenants for no other reason than to steal their money. She wanted their social security check. She wanted that cash. So she just had to dispose of them to get to it. So she saw her victims as obstacles. They were barriers that were getting in the way of something that she wants. And she very cool and calm and in a very calculated manner dispatched them so she could have their money. Although no charges were brought against any others, it has long been suspected that Puente must have had an accomplice. The issue of her disposing of the bodies creates one of the big mysteries of her case, because Dorothea was not a large person. Some of these people were fairly large. And, and even to move a 100-pound sack of potatoes takes a fair amount of force. There's reason to believe that Dorothea actually enlisted the help of some other tenants who would prefer to be her helper in the burial than her victim being buried. It was obvious to us, given the bodies, especially Bert, someone helped her carry these bodies down. I have suspicions. I have my own opinion, who I believe helped her. But that's just something that I will always leave for the investigation. During her time in prison, Puente remained in the limelight. She released a book of recipes called Cooking with a Serial Killer in 2004. And in 2008, she agreed to meet with Sacktown magazine journalist Martin Kuz in the prison visitor's hall. I waited and I waited and I waited some more. And as I sat there, I thought, I've been duped. Uh, I've fallen for another Dorothea Puente ruse. Uh, I scanned the room, wondering if perhaps I had missed her, but knowing that I hadn't. And that's when the door clanked open once more and in walked Dorothea. Martin was keen to speak to the 79-year-old who hadn't been seen or heard for 15 years. This was the first time I had ever interviewed a serial killer. So I stood up to greet her. Uh, we shook hands. Her hand felt small, bony. Um, she gave me a tight smile, and we began. Puente seemed happy to make small talk, but whenever Martin steered the conversation towards her crimes, she gave him short shrift. I said very um, explicitly to her that we were coming up on the 20th anniversary of her arrest, and that I was interested in talking to her 
about the case. Before I got uh, very far into that preamble, she interrupted me, and for the first time, she looked me square in the eye and said, I'm not guilty. She would never have admitted to her crimes because what purpose would that serve? I mean, often when we see cases of serial killers who are caught and sent to prison, we think that's the end of the story, but it's not because they will continue to manipulate people behind bars. They will continue to pull people's strings and get the things that they want. After meeting with Puente six times, Martin's visit suddenly stopped after the killer had asked him to buy her $115 worth of gifts. In our final conversation, I asked her, how does it feel to be known as a murderer? And she looked me square in the eye and said, I don't give a shit what anyone else thinks. And that to me was uh, as telling as any comment that she had made to me in the time that we had been talking. This was someone who was in effect uh, revealing that no matter what people may think of her, she didn't care. On March the 27th, 2011, Dorothea Puente died in prison. She was 82 years old. She took all her secrets to the grave. When I heard she died, I mean, it made me feel good. I, I just I had like a, a relief. If she was still alive and I saw her, I couldn't forgive her. I should, because it's the human thing to do. But in my heart, no, I really wouldn't want to. There's nothing I can do, though. She's, she's gone. Mom's gone. She's gone. So it's over. Dorothea Puente was a predator. She didn't look like one. She was a wolf in sheep's clothing, but the way that she chose her victims, she would pick people who others didn't care about, people who she could prey on. She's essentially a parasite who hooks onto people, gets what she wants out of them, and then coldly disposes of their bodies. So, so she really is an incredibly dangerous character. She was a very evil woman, and a woman that when she made her mind up what she was gonna do, she did it without hesitation, without remorse. She set out on a journey, and um, that journey ended November 11th, 1988, when we arrived at her doorstep. When you look at 1426 F Street today, it's difficult to imagine the horrors that took place inside. When tenants arrived here, they would have felt comfortable meeting the sweet-looking landlady. But in Dorothea Puente's eyes, they were subhuman. Her only reason for taking them in was to kill them, steal their money, and bury them in her yard. Puente took any remorse she may have had for her victims to the grave. She will always be remembered as one of the world's most evil killers.